podcasting does not come as naturally as leaves to a tree, then it had better not come at all. One of his many fire lines yeah. in this movie. It's hard. Wishaw is so gentle, it's actually hard to do an impression. Uh, agree it's, with it's you, so, but... It's so incredibly I agree gentle. with what you're saying. He's like an ASMR. Hard to do an impression, but... YouTuber. I hear that voice. Obviously, Paddington is part of this, but like I hear the voice and I'm like, I know who that is. That's Ben W. It's got a very, very distinctive. Voice. Yeah, he's been in the pocket for so long. Yes, y- like he was kind of born in the pocket. Yeah, I guess. Like. I mean, look, like... I wasn't there, but I wouldn't be surprised if he came out in a pocket. <laughs> well, I was wa- watching this and I was revisiting Cloud Atlas. I was like, oh, he's so good in like yeah. the late aughts, early tens. And I'm like, he's still good. He's still doing great work. I remember. Uh, like the two girl, cool girls I was friends with in high school saw him in a play. So this would have been early 2000s. Was it Hamlet? I think it must have been. Yes, because that was, that was sort big, of his breakout. That was his big right. thing. Yeah. Uh, and were just like upset. They were like, this is the most astounding guy in the world. And that was when he started showing up in like tiny roles in movies, like Enduring Love and stuff. He, and they were like, right you don't back. understand. This is the guy. So the Ben Wishaw Hamlet was 2004. I was 18. I okay. saw it. And it was like one of those things where when it was announced, it was like, who's this fucking young whippersnapper that they're claiming is ready to take on Hamlet? That's the thing. It's right. usually Hamlet is the role you get once you're the big boy. You work up to it. Yeah. But then, of course, the director, Trevor Nunn, was like, Hamlet's not old. Like, right. Hamlet is supposed to be yeah. in his 20s. Right. Like, right. And, but it and still that was, was his a thing. statement to be like, we think we found a guy right. young enough with the clout and the, so, the, s- the grav- maturity, gravitas. intelligence, gravitas to be able to pull off an age-appropriate Hamlet. And it was the best production of Hamlet I've ever seen. Wow. Um, and uh, it was one of those things where it's like, this will be a guy. Yeah. Even with all that said, I don't think... And I, like him playing John Keats, I could have seen that. I yeah. don't think I could have seen the fullness of Wish Shaw's no, like, well, run. Like, look, there are a lot of this will be a guy guys who don't pan out. Yeah. Or it takes longer to pan out. Like, let me throw out two examples of people, Okay. And we're going deep, so I should just say right right up top as quickly as I can. This is a podcast about filmographies. It's called Blank Check the Griffin. David, I'm Griffin. David. Uh, it's about directors who have massive <laughs> success early on in their careers who experience a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce. Baby. Mm-hmm. And this is a mini series on the films of Jane Campion. It's called The Podcastiano. And uh, this is uh, her final film before an incredibly rude 12 year break from being allowed to make movies. Well, I say allowed. I, yeah, I wouldn't she say two TV She took seasons. a soft retirement, I would say, or a, a long yeah. hiatus. She wasn't in any kind of director jail, was no, she? No. no this was no. self self appointed. I mean, yes. in yeah. the cut was the director jail, the and this yeah. was sort of the director jail comeback, which mm-hmm. critically I think was accepted as such. Yeah. But we'll talk about this when it's released. It was released by a uh, a distribution company, uh, uh, humorously enough, called Apparition, mm-hmm. that barely existed, uh, that only existed for six months. Yeah. This was one of like eight films they ever released before it disappeared, and they never really understood how to get things out there. So the movie did not make that much of an impact. And then she does the move that, unfortunately, it feels like a lot of filmmakers are stuck into now, especially for her generation, where it's like, your movies don't get made anymore, do TV. Can you tell me... The Apparition movies. Yes, because I did this the other day. Sure. Uh, I'm not going to get them in order. Sure. There's seven total. Right. Okay. Oh, you're lucky. It's a six month. It's like October to March. Yeah. Oh, nine to ten. Essentially. Right? Yeah. Okay. The last one is The Runaways. Yeah. That's the last major one. There were two ones after that that I've never heard of. Spider and The Square. Yes. Okay. Neither of which are uh, The Spider or The Square I would have gotten both of those and I resent (laughs) you giving them to me. Sorry. You said the last one is The Runaways, though, and I was saying... Well, I was wrong, but I knew those titles. So wrong. That's I always forget the name of it, but it's that Australian film collective that's like the two Edgertons. <laughs> the, the, the right. show. It's it's a Nash Edgerton joint right. starring Joel Edgerton. Right. Yes. And then uh, uh Spider is as well. They're they're part of that Australian they're both group. Nash Edgertons, yes. Right. You're right, you're right. And David Michaud. That's that right. Guy. I just said yeah, both yeah, Edgertons, yeah. Michaud, the guy who directed Hesher is the one non Australian guy in the group, and I feel like there's one you think other make guy. Fun of him? Yeah, all the time. This guy ain't a, yeah. ain't a nosy. Whenever he's like, when I grew up in America, they go, what? what? Yeah. Um, anyway, go Okay, on. so they those two come out post-Runaways, which is wide release, Bright Star, and then the other two are... Can you give me a hint? Uh, Keep one them is, vague, though. One is a sequel 
to a cult hit. Right. Uh, fuck. Oh, oh, it's Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day. Correct. One is a period piece, much like Bright Star. Young Victoria. Yes. And one is a sort of genre, you know, parody comedy movie. Hmm. It's, it's a, a genre? It's a, a black exploitation. Oh, black dynamite. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, just a funny little, funny little run. I mean, now I have to say this, but Apparition was Bob Burney, who just had like the two most incredible independent box office performances of all time in the early 2000s. He's in charge of IFC Films. They released Big Fat Greek Wedding. It makes $260 million domestic. It is still the highest grossing romantic yep. comedy of all time by some metric, right? And then he leaves IFC and he starts New Market and New Market releases the Passion of the Christ, which for oh, 20 wow. years was the highest R-rated film of all time and breaks all sorts of other records. So there was that moment where you're like, Bob Burney is a genius. He is the master of distribution. He can somehow turn these indie films into blockbusters that outgross big budget studio films. And then he has a run after that that continues to this day where every couple of years he's like, I'm ready. It's my new company. We're going to recreate the magic. And every single time the company lasts for less than two years, releases six movies that pretty much fail to connect. Right. He gets one maybe that's like a double or a triple. Right. And then the company goes under. And it's like Picture House was one of them. Apparition. Mm -hmm. There was the one that released Drive that I'm forgetting the name of that was supposed to be more sort of genre focused. Well, I'm going to get you that name right now. He always just, has like second. funding from something. They put the money behind Film district? Him. Must be yes. so easy to start a production company. Why well, don't I do it? If you, you should, have, Fran and Pictures. People just give you money. And then if you don't do anything, they're like, ah, well. Fran yeah. Films. Fran Films? Yeah, Fran why films. not? Yeah, sure. Yeah. 20th century Fran. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Couldn't be yeah. good. But do you want to be part of the 20th century? or do you 21st wanna, century. Yeah. Do you what about be... 22nd century, Fran? Mm. I'm not dying, so that seems fine. Yeah. Yeah. You're living mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. We know about forever. you. You are 23 years old. You're six foot one and you're immortal. That's right. Yeah. Did mm -hmm. I get those numbers right? Uh, I usually say I'm 5'8". But here's, oh, the, okay. here's the thing. And yeah. we haven't talked about this. I do think I got taller during COVID. And I'm I'm not doing a bit. I for years was one height, and I mm. now I'm a different height when measured. You got I mean, look. I'm not trying to discredit the long COVID. You got some, you got some hair height. Sure, your hair's a little taller than it, it usually yeah. is. I feel like. I don't know, but I feel like you're not like that. when I stand up. I'm like, whoa, too tall. I think <laughs> oh, I got you taller. Go like, look, <laughs> like you're sort of like you <laughs> yeah. Know. There's obviously right. another name you go by, which is medium Chicago. That's true. Yeah. Well, I, maybe it was moving to New York that made me tall. Maybe. I got stretched Something out. Something in the New York water the New makes York water. the bagels yeah, yeah, tasty yeah. and Fran tall. You notice I got tall. Well, <laughs> I haven't actually noticed, but I can check Fran it out. Fran Hoffner's okay. our guest today. Fran Hoffner's Fran. our guest today, editor of Fran Magazine, yeah. obviously. 22nd well, century, century Fran. Welcome to the Five Timers Club. Thank you so much. Okay. Wait. Public Enemies, Wait, Aliens. Wow. Uh, uh, fucking. Uh, the Hustle uh, Day. Which one? The Hosler Day. The Hosler Day. And what's yeah. the fourth one? I'm forgetting. The Great Mouse Detective. Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course. Five Timers Club. Now, you want to know something else that's wild about uh, Fran's uh, run there? What? All of those four previous movies are the movies that Ben got his nicknames from in those series. The hey. Hosler hey. Day. Wow. Benz. The Great Mouse Fart Detective. Public Detect Benemies. Ben Star. Public Benemies. Right. Ben. Benz with a dollar well, sign. Well, so then what do we do about... Bright Star. How do we Bright work ben. ben into that one? Bright Ben. Pressure's Bright Ben isn't that good. Okay. <laughs> you think we can mm. do better? Oh, wait, okay. hold on. Uh, white Bright Benny. You want mm. white? No, because like White Hot Benny. Yeah. Right, Is Bright right. Star Benny kind of funny? Kind of funny. Yeah, it's sure. like kind it's of not funny. bad. I mean, I'm just always looking for a different format or a different way to riff on it. This is a movie that is about two things that Ben has pursued in his life: fashion and poetry. That's true, yeah. You had yeah. a big poetry phase. Absolutely, yeah. I went to the new school for, um, I guess, writing. I don't know. <laughs> but you were like, <laughs> I don't know what my degree I remember what you went there for. <laughs> but Not you were really. focused on poetry at that. Yeah, no, I was taking you know, a ton of writing classes. Right. wrote a lot of poetry. And you were going yeah. to like poetry slams. This is the period of time no, you talked about. No, I was going about. to poetry slams. You were slamming. I was never slamming. You went to Jeff, Jeff Comedy Jams. You're, you're getting confused. No, I didn't go to those They're basically either. the same. No, I would go to like, you know, uh, poetry readings. You know, yeah, sure. like open mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Open, the, the, open the, mic poetry. The and you would come with a fucking pog slammer and you'd slam it down. Yeah, absolutely. I'd throw it down. <laughs> what would you call the the heavy pog? Slammer. It was a slammer. That was a joke I was making. No, I know. I, I was like, that's it. It was called the it's slammer. Called the slammer, right? I think so. I can't remember. I think so. I just remember when you got a good one, you were like, oh boy. Look, this is clearly a blockbuster episode. We've established many 
many threads here. We have. But can I circle back to Wish Off for a moment? Yes. Yeah. So we're talking about this sort of phenomenon of like, oh, this is going to be a guy, right? If I could throw two other counterpoints of like dudes who like come out of the theater and it's like, we're telling you this is a leading man. This guy's got movie star potential, right? There's someone like Tom Hardy who very young gets like the Star Trek role and they're mm-hmm. like, look, this is a guy. And then it takes sort of like eight years for him to figure Took out his thing. Took him a while. Right? Mm-hmm. Like he was established and he works after that, but it takes eight years until you're like, oh, that's who he is. He figured out his persona on screen, right? Mm-hmm. And then not to be rude, but we were talking off mic in a recent episode about Benjamin Walker, who's a perfect example of like, oh, wait till you see this fucking guy. He's tall and he's handsome and he's a leading man. And it just has never connected. Not not on film. Not obviously. on film. Obviously, I don't know who this is. He was bloody buddy Andrew Jackson himself. And then oh. he was Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. His, his, oh, big, oh, oh. his big Marvel role was that. Although he was certain. I mean, he's she's Marvel. Franchise. Movie. Role. Right. Yeah. Guys, they've taken over movies so much that I'm calling movies Marvel. But he wow. was supposed Thought to play Beast. He, in was, the he ex- was young X Men. I believe he was first oh. cast, right? It was be- yeah. He yes. was like literally. He was announced. Had, was and then it's Holt thing. and then Peters, or the I other way around. He turned it down. No, it's Holt the whole time. Oh, it's Holt. Peters the whole is time. Quicksilver. That's okay. Uh, it was Fraser, Kelsey Grammer himself. I was like, oh, just the the main Fraser. And then it was announced as Walker, and then I yeah. think he left it to do Abraham Lincoln. I think Lincoln. he did, and then he was in the Ron Howard Whale Cannibal right. movie. He did a Nicholas Sparks movie. Uh. Yes, in the heart uh, of the sea. In yes. the heart of the sea, the, I the Nicholas see Sparks that. movie I would is love called that. "You Would Love." The choice it's really, unfortunately, yeah. not good, and it really should be good. Uh, you know who else is in "In the Heart of the Sea" though? Tom Actually, Holland. Uh, yes, that's true. But do you know who else is in "In the Heart of the Sea"? And which one? As Herman Melville that's himself. That's right. Yeah, huh? I was looking this one up because the whole point of "In the Heart the of the Sea" is being told to him. Exactly. It's what, like yeah. it's, it's like what Moby Dick was inspired on, by. Right. Yeah. So it starts with him visiting. I guess Hemsworth. I think it's Hemsworth. I think it's Hemsworth. Is old Hemsworth? Yeah, or whatever. Like one of them. And he's I thought like, it was Tell Holland. Tell me your story of whale. I think Holland's just one of the guys in the boat. It might I know, be but Holland. I thought Holland, since he's the Holland. kid, is the one who's like, you're uh, seeing the no. story from who's relaying it to Wishaw. Am I wrong about you that? You are correct. It is Holland. Okay, you're right. thank yeah. you. But the whole thing that's, with that movie is... Because I was like, is, that's his fucking role in the film, is that he's the he's young the survivor boy. who right, remembers survivor. it all. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the whole thing with that movie is you're like, they're hunting whales, and you're like, I love it. Teach me how to hunt whales. And then the whale fucks their ship up and then half the movie is them just stuck on the ship being like should we eat each other yeah and you're like this is a bummer i wanted more whale you know anyway wish uh, my point is just he's one of those guys where some of these guys it just doesn't translate to movies or they just don't get the right roles or whatever it is and wish went from being like theater hotshot we're pegging this guy as the next dude right to then like completely acquitting himself uh, incredibly well in supporting roles, small roles in Indian for, you know, uh, indie art house movies. And then he just like every step he does properly, yeah. like he then transitions to like leading roles in smaller films. His two franchises are Bond and Paddington. Like he has somehow come out of this not having to like pay his dues in some bullshit. Oh, but yeah, obviously the Bond is it's a supporting but, role, but, but it's... kind. I would argue that's sort of the best way to do it if you're Ben Wishaw. Of course. He steals Wishaw every scene he's in. He's in 12 out. minutes of those movies. Exactly. Yeah. Every no. single time. Oh, he's always perfect. That doesn't stretch him like outside of what he's good at. Yeah. He doesn't he's... look silly. He's like in the pocket. Yeah. Paddington, he's in the pocket. Yeah. He's working with like blue chip directors and actors. Well, I was going to say those two movies are also the only things he does or those, you know, franchises are the only things he does where he does not seem to be actively dying as yes. a sort of his character type. I'm well, like, oh, he's so robust in the big budget he is stuff. such a fragile man. He's withering. I <laughs> just, my thing with Wishaw. I call him Ben Withershaw. Yeah. I saw him in that um, Hamlet. Sure. I saw him with my friend Ollie, I'm pretty sure. Okay. I grew up in England. We're just going to get this right out of the way because okay. it's going to be all over this episode. You guys don't even know. But what? I did grow up I just, uh, in England. Sorry, I was just in the other room. What's up? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, from the years 1995 to 2008, lived in the country England, contained within the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and Northern Ireland. You didn't even get to see the Olympics. What? I didn't. I didn't. Mm. Who's I? Yeah, I don't, under- <laughs> I don't understand what? the structure of this. That's what you just can't. Is this a, is it an initial? Is, this a is, by initial? I, is this David Sims, Sims in the room with us now? Hmm? I said, is this David Sims in the room with us now? Yeah, can we speak to him? <laughs> Knock three times and it'd be me. 
Um, and I remember when um, Ben Whishaw then popped up in a show called Nathan Barley that some people may okay. remember, which was a Chris <clears throat> Morris, if you know Chris Morris, mm-hmm. Brass oh, yeah. Eye, Four Lions, yeah. right? Sitcom. Uh, that was originally supposed to be called Cunt. That's just basically. <laughs> oh, oh, whoa. Sorry. That's just basically about like the worst trust fund hipster guy ever, okay. right? It is Nathan Barley. Ben Wishaw does not play Nathan Barley. I was going to He say. plays like one of the kids at like the Vice Magazine type place he works mm-hmm. called Pingu, who Nathan Barley's always like, what? Yeah, you know, like mean to. And we were like, the guy we just saw like fucking smoke the house yeah. as Hamlet is playing fucking Pingu. Is this show good? Nathan Barley, yeah, really funny. Well, it, it sounds it's, great. It's, I've it's never it's heard of it. It's abrasive, but it's really well, funny. I love Morris. So. Uh, and he was also in that thing, Griff, if you remember, Perfume. Right. The story of, of a murderer. I forgot. Oh, yeah. right, where he plays the damn perfume plays, murderer. Right. You know? <laughs> right. And it was like, okay. So, was on him early. Exactly. Yeah. And so the vibe seemed to be, he'd also played Keith Richards in the movie Stoned, which is like a horribly right, bad uh, What Happened to Brian yeah. Jones yeah. movie. Yeah. And it's, it was like, okay, so this guy's going to play like little squirrely weirdos, right? right. Like that's going to be his zone. Yeah. He'll do British. Right. And then he was in I'm Not There and you're mm. like, okay. Yeah. Someone's, whatever, he seems, the, the major directors are are, are, yeah. are plucking him now, right? Yeah. Like he was one of the Dylans. He's one of the six Dylans. Right. I'm trying to remember which time period he's yeah. like Which the one form? who's like arthur rimbaud who's like the the you know the poet right oh, right <laughs> well, is... typecast. <laughs> yeah seriously yeah i haven't seen that movie in years that movie is i just watched that last year one of the many reasons we should do todd haynes you know, you know yeah. what i mean his haynes... many like weird takes on a blank check haynes was like my number nine for my quadrant of the bracket last mm. year and i kind of regret not putting him on for that's sure. such a good blanchett in that movie Obviously, Blanchett's right. great, but you know what I mean with Haynes. Well, yeah, which it's one like, is Blanchett again? She's sort of the like uh, sunglasses. Uh, you know, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. She's the, like the Dylan Warhol factory. Yeah. Hell yeah! yeah. The, right. You know, the uh, don't look back, back type, right. Dylan. You right. know, you know this is before. I think she... Ledger is unbelievable in that I movie. Agree. I think that's like one of his most underrated performances. Yeah. I da- yes, yes, uh, and I, I, that's. I'll say this. That's maybe the most I've ever liked Richard Gere. I, I, I really like Richard Gere <laughs> Take in general. That back. Right. Uh, so I think that's a little rude of you to say, but I do love the Richard Gere moments. He's not my it's favorite so, movie star. I, I know but you I, don't love Richard I, Gere. Right? I think he's really good in that. He's really good. Yeah. Um, but you know what I mean with, yes. with Haynes where it's like Velvet Goldmine. That's kind of a blank check. Yeah. I'm not there. Absolutely. And then Wonderstruck, of course. They're all, he's I such mean, a weird, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. he always will it's take his It's that miniseries thing then, we love where it's just like every movie movie is a wild swing from the one before but like all three of the like safe is yeah. the guarantor that lets him do velvet gold mine right you know far from heaven like yeah. velvet gold doesn't do he goes so far from heaven that does well enough that it's like okay can i make this weird dylan movie right can, and then that does badly right and then carol again yeah they're like fuck haynes okay right what do you want to do i want to turn this children's book into a weird black and white kind right. of silent movie yeah. like again he'll he'll always take the swing i and i like all of his movies like i i like I, all of his i movies defend wonder except for right. wonderstruck which i was like underwhelmed by. yeah i was not wonderstruck but maybe i'd sure. like it on rewatch uh maybe and then what was the other thing I was going to say about? Oh, Dark Water just feels like one of those oh. things where you're like, is this cows. like for hire? Is this like him just fucking like taking a steady job? Yeah, to recover why from is a Todd flop? Haynes making this movie? Right? And you're yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. that's a quietly one of the best directed movies the last five years. It's incredible movie. Anyway, that movie's so good. That's yeah. when I remember but like his work on that is incredible. I'm not there. Yeah. yeah, is when I remember being like, I guess Wish Shaw is going to level up. He's not right. going to just be the right. squirrely it's gonna guy. Work. Right, you know. It's going to work. And and when he does do squirrely, he picks it well. Absolutely. Like, be squirrely in James Bond. Be squirrely cute. That's going to fucking help you. And now you don't have to play like a Marvel villain or whatever, you know? Like, he's got his fucking block. And then Paddington is one of those things where that movie was announced as Colin Firth. Mm. And he was recast like three months before it came out. Mm. He was like a late change. Right. That I think both helps the movie tremendously. Yeah. That film would not have connected the same way with Colin Firth as much as I like Probably him. Probably not love Colin Firth. No. On paper, don't, when he was announced, really, why, you're like... Do we know why they changed? Like, yeah, was it not yeah. working? So he was announced and you're like, that makes sense. He's polite, right? Colin mm-hmm. Firth. Yeah, lovely Englishman. And then they played the movie and and uh, what's his name? Um, the Harry Potter producer. Who, David Heyman. Heyman. Yes. Yeah. Heyman just was like, look, we love Colin Firth. He's a wonderful actor. He recorded this for us. We played it. We all watched it. We all agreed. It's weird when Paddington sounds too much like an adult. 
Yeah, I was going to say right, he's too much right. for uh, Wishaw, grown-ups. Wishaw's voice He's too much younger. of a man, and, and Wishaw really helped us because his voice is so gentle. That light, mm-hmm. gentle voice. Yeah. You know, it's like, obviously, Bright Star is sort of his big follow-up to, like, I'm not there. He'd been yeah. in that Bride's Head Revisited remake that didn't really go anywhere. Right. He was in, he, Apparently, he's in The International, another, as you say, Tom Tickfer. Tickfer always. And him. he's got a small part in Hologram for the King. <gasps> Your favorite movie. Oh, I love that movie. Have you ever seen that movie, Fran? No, do you actually like it? Yeah, I Griffin do. is the only, okay. person, I'm the only person on God's Green it. Earth who's ever seen that movie. Yeah. And not only that, I've seen it multiple times. Wow. I saw it in theaters. I would watch it. I watched it again in pandemic because I was like, am I crazy? Right. I remember am I going to rewatch this and think I would watch Hologram for King. Why not? It's, it's good. Is it better than The Circle? I've never seen The Circle. It has to be. <laughs> it's just funny that, uh, to that Tom Hanks is in two Dave Eggers movies. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Hanks is also crazy good. I mean, that's the funny thing is like, we talked about how Hanks is still so proud of Cloud Atlas, and you're like, he comes out of Cloud Atlas and 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 is like, I want to work with Tickler again, right? And then he does Hologram for the King, and he's like, I want to do Eggers again, right? Yeah, and then he's like, maybe I should stop following. Okay, this. all right, yeah, okay, right. okay, okay, I get it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, when Hanks was on Bill Simmons, yeah, and he's, Bill Simmons was like, give me your three favorites. And he said Cloud Atlas is right. one of them. It was truly. He's right. He's right. I know. But, and he's right. Simmons he's right to like, say it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I was thinking more like Splash, you know, like, right. you know, you could, but anyway, it was really funny. Yeah, he was. Um, love Ben Wishaw mm-hmm. is all we're, we're, we all agree. We all love yeah. him. Wishaw. So that movie is all about they're trying to sell their like. <laughs> he's on hologram. He's hologram build. What? <laughs> Wishaw plays the hologram. Uh-huh. Do you know this? That's for not the true. King? Yes. The premise of that movie is that they like work for some telecommunications company, like some Zoom Skype it's, company. It's, it's hollow teleconferencing. You'll right. see the whole person. Or right. Whatever. And they're right. trying to make a sales pitch to like the, the king of Saudi Arabia. Exactly. I believe. Yes. Yeah. And so they set up this tent in the middle of the desert and the whole movie is sort of this waiting for Godot thing of like once a day, the person comes to the tent and goes like the king will not be coming today. Sure. Yeah. They have to be ready every day. And he never comes. Yeah. Right. And Hanks is just sort of on this like quixotic uh, uh, kind of mission to somehow get the king's attention. He can't go through the levels of bureaucracy. Um, and they're in the middle, this tent in the middle of the desert where there are just completely empty uh, skyscrapers being constructed where they want development, but like no one's there. And Wishaw is the guy from like headquarters who's going to be the hologram in the presentation. Corporate so he Wishaw. is in the movie for less than three minutes. He gets and Ben Wishaw. For, he better, yeah. And most of his role is like watching him do tests where they're like, and throw the apple, and then he catches the apple in the hologram. Like, they just do but that's sort of like, for being like Ben, yeah. we're getting you in there. It's so good. And at the end, you see him go like, thank you for our present- watching our presentation. You know? Wow. I mean, he's obviously, the thing I'm not acknowledging, which is right it's after Bright Star, the titular is, role. and pre-Paddington, um, mm-hmm. is The Hour, which is uh, this really fun oh, ABC show. Yeah, that show's great. I watched that show. He did with Rama Laguerre, which oh, is about right. like... Uh, launching a current affairs show at the sure. BBC in the fifties. Right. Um, so that's a that's a big one. It was a big uh-huh. Tumblr show. Yeah. People on Very Tumblr love to go show. crazy. Because sort of, it was sort of like big, right. making it was when gifts people were crazy of the hour for, BBC, for Tumblr. Sherlock. Yeah. And, right. It's and a fun he, show. He was he sort of at this point becomes an early thinking woman's internet boyfriend. Absolutely. Right? This is the 100%. other thing. Is I I start to at this point in time here every once in a while meet someone who just goes like. He is my number one crush. He drives me insane. Like, I cannot stand how much Ben Wishaw turns me on. I, I meet people over years who are just like, I know he's gay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just am driven wild by him. He's, he's a real cutie patootie. That's, I want to say that's another unique thing about him is like he's sort of the first of that generation where it's like he comes out of drama school. He's in plays. And he is not convinced to go back in the closet when he goes to movies and TV. He's a very have you his he is a very thoughtful interview. Yes. Uh, anytime I read an interview with him, I uh, just am very struck by how thoughtful. he's never giving like what feel like canned answers. Yeah. He just sure, feels yeah. like a thoughtful dude. He's married to, of course, mm-hmm. the composer of this movie. Yes, Mark Bradshaw, oh. right? Which is hot. Pretty hot. Pretty hot. Like even guys like that who were like art house guys, it was just like, look, when you come to Hollywood, just it's don't ask, don't tell. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no,
you know, big star, but he'll he'll pop up in a Mary Poppins, which he uh, which he, he he does crush. Oh, is obviously. he in? Oh, David and I both just like that movie. Sad fucking song. Well, of course he does. Yeah, he, he plays the grown up Banks child. He's the grown up oh, boy. Of course, he plays of the course. little boy, which is like it's him okay. and Emily Mortimer, which is really good casting. Yeah, like, they both yeah, feel like grown up Disney children. In yeah. their Britishness. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, he's got this one scene. David sees a screening and he's like, I don't care for this thing at all, but Wisha has one scene where he just goes like atomic. You will not believe it. <laughs> wow. Suddenly he just fucking grabs you and it, it decimates. It's like emotionally devastating. And it, you cannot wonderful. believe he pulled it my out of the movie that's otherwise it, like not really gripping you. And I look, my only issue is when I watch it and then I rewatch the movie at some point, I was like, what are kids getting out of this? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I, just, I can't imagine but for much. us, we're like fucking losing it. Um, yeah. Anyway, love him. I'm trying to think of any, well, I thought well, he was really fun Uriah Heep and David Copperfield. See, I was, I was, he's almost mm. a little too big in that for me, which is a crazy thing to say about him. Uriah Heep though is such a, a big ridiculous I mean the funniest he's, thing about David Copperfield is like he's like who could be fucking with me and you're right he's like I have no idea yeah 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 it's <laughs> really this guy but that's another movie where I I saw that I sort of like that David Copperfield but I don't know what the target audience is for it because mm. it's like a little too elementary for adults yeah I mean I saw it at Toronto pretty yeah. tired and was like I thought that was cute and I like the spirit of it yeah it's totally nice I haven't nice. remembered it very well it's just weird to see him go big, and it's sort of he's like the Hanks thing, where I'm like, I don't want to see Ben Wishaw be bad. Sure, I don't want to see this. He's gentle. Don't do this to I me. I didn't, Griff. I did not watch Fargo season. I want to say four, the Chris Rock season. Apparently Three. He, I haven't watched it either. He's on that. He's in four. I keep That's forgetting the one I skipped. that uh, it's Chris Rock, Jesse Buckley, Jason, Jason Schwartzman, Schwartzman Wishaw, Ben Wishaw, okay. and Jack Houston. Right. Three is McGregor. Okay. Three is the Ewan McGregor twins and Carrie yeah. Coon. And I've Mary never Smith seen Winston and Thulis. Yep. Thulis this, in naked mode. It is. Mm, we love. Really? Yeah. In season and three? Yeah. But that's. She means Mike awful. Lee's naked, not that he's oh, naked. Oh, oh, oh. oh. I was going to say, I yeah, forgot yeah, yeah. Dong in I that. mean, Mike Lee's. He's twisted. Um, yeah. He's right, scary. Scary I mean, Thulis. So uh, right after Bright Star 2009, then it's like Tempest mm -hmm. and The Hour starts. And then 2012, obviously, Skyfall, Cloud Atlas. Mm -hmm. And then since then, it's like zero theorem. Yeah, well, he's really good in The Lobster. Paddington. Uh, Lobster, I was going to say, mm -hmm. is really good. Suffrage doesn't exist. I remember him being <laughs> good in The Danish Girl, a horrible movie. Right. He's Herman Melville, as I said. Right. He's hologram in Mary the Poppins. King. He's the hologram. That movie Little Joe kind of was a festival movie that yeah. didn't go anywhere. That right. movie Surge was a festival movie People like movie that show that with him anywhere. and Hugh Grant. Uh-huh. Very Oh, very English scandal. scandal. Very right. English scandal. And then, yeah, and then he plays Rabbi Milligan in Fargo. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> Can no one give me the Fargo report? Uh, anyway, yeah. love Ben Wishaw. Oh, and he's doing the Ira Sachs movie now. Oh, good. Oh, that's nice. With uh, perfect, like perfect match. Adele yeah. Exer Coppolis. Mm -hmm. Love and, her. I miss her. Uh, Franz Rogowski. It's like a, oh, a great oh, fucking a international what? hottie cast. What is this, the Are Avengers 5? Yeah. That's about my internet boyfriend right now. Two men who've been Rogowski. together for 15 years, and what happens when Ooh. one of them has an affair with He's a woman? Cute. I want to watch those three people have sex with each other. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, no, Franz so Rogowski is amazing. Ben? Griffin. 20. 22. That's the year we're in. Year of our Lord. Yes. Yep. In past years, you've sometimes made some resis. Uh, yes. I, I've Some uh, of your resolutions. Yep. I, I don't always, think you did it this year. I, you know, yeah, not yet. I'm working on some. I mean, I think I think the big thing for me right now is I want to um, start playing the trumpet again mm. and potentially join like a salsa band. That sounds obvious. Uh, yeah. I'd say probably my biggest resolution, um, learn how to take care of myself in like a general sense, like learn how to like be a person maybe you know what i'm saying that's a good goal right i'd say like fix everything in my life maybe sure sure, sure. but then starting with hygiene yes mm -hmm. right basic health mm -hmm. yeah. uh functionality right uh but also you know saving more spending less that's one of my top goals for 2022 and i got a question and this is targeted i'm 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 putting you on blast ben all right. Why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for wireless? I can't even Why answer are you that. Doing it. I don't know. I like, don't even know. The answer is so clear. Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save this year. Okay. Interesting. So wait, does Mint Mobile help me to maximize my savings? Ben, they're through the first company to that... sell premium wireless service only. Yes. And and by doing that, they do let you, in fact, maximize your saving with plans starting at. You want to take a guess? I don't know. Just like. Maybe fifteen dollars a month would seem like. Did a, you say fifty? 
Uh, no. I, you, if you said fifty, you're dead wrong. It's just fifteen dollars a month. Now I don't know if you know this. I don't want to say this too loudly. Okay, should I lean in? Yeah. All right. What's up? Deadpool knows that he's in a movie. That's true. That is canon. But can I say something that's even crazier? Yeah. Ryan Reynolds knows that he's one of the owners of Mint Mobile. Holy shit, really? Yeah. And he's like, he just puts it out there? Yeah, he's just like, drink my gin, use my cellular wireless plan. I'm drinking this gin right now. It's great. Yeah, it's very secret. It's secret. Right. Don't tell anybody. But for people looking for Reed, did you know? This year, don't, did I? Don't, not too loudly. Sorry. Ryan, I was going to ask if knows the that, way yeah. to being a free guy yes. is through financial you independence. You've got to be a free guy through the financial independence. <laughs> it's what you got to do. I'm putting our listeners on red notice. I'm officially putting all of our listeners on red notice by going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail. Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you. All right. So you've piqued my interest, Griffin. Can you, though, tell me, like, all right, how am I going to go about yeah, saving? All plans come with unlimited text. High-speed data and unlimited talk. Delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Does that sound like a savings? Definitely maybe. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. You keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. The crudes to a new age. With Mint Mobile, you choose the amount of monthly data that's right for you and stop paying for data that you never use, Van Helsing. And by Van Helsing, I mean Van Wilder. You switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. Safe house. Okay, so to get like a new wireless plan for just 15 sure. bucks a month yes. and get the plan shipped to my door, like I'm assuming, could I get it for free? Yep, Deadpool Wow, too. wow, okay. So what, what should I do, Griff? You go to mintmobile.com yeah. slash check. Okay. That's mintmobile.com slash check to cut your wireless bill. Cut, cut. To 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash check. He's really good in Adventureland. I think that's his best performance. Have you seen Just Friends? Good movie. I love Just Friends. It's actually. really good. <laughs> I actually, I love Just Friends. Yeah. That movie secretly rules. The other lead actors in this movie we have to talk about. One, we've got Abby Cornish, who, when I see this movie, I'm like, okay. She's amazing. This is going to be a big actor. Well, and let's acknowledge she's in two Australian indies, the first of which is Somersault, yep. directed by Kate Shortland, who goes on to, di- of course, direct Black Widow, which a movie has, that oh. was definitely directed by her entirely. <laughs> sure. And which has also her has, fingerprints all over. Uh, Somersault has Sam Worthington. That's the other thing. So right. that's the movie that becomes Sam Worthington's calling card where people are like, this is a sturdy oh, Australian this is, man. Yeah, this is a new crow, a new legend. Right. And, and here she is. Here's a new ingenue, right? Both of them, I feel like that's a calling card. And two years after that, she does Candy, which is like With Ledger. Heath Ledger going back to Australia. And it sort of double verifies her as like, this is the new Australian I've seen that lady. movie. It's like a drug addiction movie. Both it's, those movies are good. She's good in it. Both it's, those movies are good. It's and sort she's of what you think really is, good right. in both of them. Right? Yeah. And then she pops up in uh, Goodyear. She drinks some wine. She pops up in Elizabeth Golden Age. She... Stop loss. Yeah, I never saw that one. This, this is the period of time where they're just like, well, she's clearly going to be a thing. Bring her around, cast her in everything. Yep. And she's one of those people where this often kind of dooms you, where she's like being put above the title as like the fourth or fifth lead in movies because Hollywood is so certain that she's inevitable. Yep. And then none of those movies kind of connect. Yeah. And it's And like... then this was the one where people were finally like, oh, that's what she does? And she's wonderful in this film, I think. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a great performance. Amazing performance. She plays Fanny Bryce, yeah. Fanny Braun. Sorry, not Fanny. I Bryce. kept on in my mind the whole movie. Keep on going like it's Bryce, right? right. Um, and post this, Ben, did you like her? I'm sorry, you seemed like you wanted to say something. No, I mean those fits. Well, well we're going to talk about the fits. She's throwing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's throwing. But everyone she's continues in, to fail to she's know how to use her in after movies. This. She's, she's like, like limitless. McDonough's. Sucker punch. She's right. Martin McDonough the likes McDonough her. The McDonough one is almost the most offensive because it's like he, he should her. write a good part for her. He and wastes he her both times. Twice wasted her entirely. Isn't it? W- she hasn't been in any of his theater stuff, has she? I don't think. Uh, so. I mean, like, it'd be one thing if he know. like made use of her on stage. It's just but, so frustrating because he clearly yeah. appreciates her talent, and both of those roles are so thankless. They're her defining thankless. characteristic in Three Billboards she is that she vagina. loves her husband's penis. Yeah. Yeah. That's truly like, what's who is this woman? Mike's her tick. She can't stop talking about how great her husband is. Doesn't he have some is. line where he's like, and you have a great vagina or something? There's some like, exchange like that where you're like, 
I don't know if this was supposed to like go over, but it just just clunks. Well, not, and she keeps the accent too. And I remember yeah. like the tenth wave of discourse on that movie is like, why does he have an Australian <laughs> wife in Missouri? Right. That's like, but you'll find those those folks anywhere. You know? I'm like, that's the last thing we should complain about. Yeah. Is it the <laughs> RoboCop remake? Yes, which sucks. That's like. I think of that, and obviously this is colored by my dislike of that movie overall, mm -hmm. but I think of that as, like, the prime example of just, like, Abby Cornish, you were supposed to be a star, you never totally connected, you're still established enough that you're in the running for the reboots that aren't the top level but are C-level, and we put you above the title, and your role is completely thankless, but you're in it a lot, she's and it in, just nothing connects. She's in Jack Ryan. For a season, and then yeah. I think she's gone. But she she's... was like the female lead for the first season, and then I think that show got new me pilled. Well, hey, it happens to us all. It happens to the best. Uh, of she's in Geostorm. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, in which she's I third saw that. build, sorry, fourth build. Gerard Butler, Jim Sturgis, they Geostorm, play brothers. Abby Cornish. Yeah. We all know. Hmm? Gerard Butler and Jim Sturgis play brothers. Really? Oh, in of Geostorm? Course. Great. And is, uh, is Hello, brother. Is Abby <laughs> Cornish like the president's daughter or is she like the young environmental council person? Looks like, like she's playing a secret service agent. Who's... What else has Geostorm been in? <laughs> Geostorm, you know, just did a great King Lear. I don't know. Yeah, Geostorm uh, did a Moonfall Geostorm. day after tomorrow. I would love to meet. Yeah. 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 Geostorm and Moonfall, I got to say, are just both evidence of like, if those guys are going to do these kinds of movies, get them back, them back together, together. You know, Put like, them back they, together. they need to yeah. be. Anyway, it hasn't been the same. Because the whole thing with Moonfall is the special effects are kind of amazing. He is incredible. Because he knows what that. he's doing. Yeah, he and knows. everything else is such I know. dog shit. I know. And you're like, you need, I know Devlin's a hack, but you need, Devlin. he at least knows how to put these pieces Devlin together for you. Devlin has that. like the hack sentimentality down pat. Right. And, uh, Right, and Geostorm was one of those movies where, like, they it, it had, like, some of the most expensive reshoots ever because they were, like, you fucked up all the action stuff. Right, because he doesn't know what he's doing. You had to, they had to bring in fucking second unit guys to come in and reshoot. You forgot the Geostorm! Right. That's what I'd like to, I just imagine some, like, Al Pacino with a cigar, yeah. you know, some old exec watching. He's like, where's the Geostorm? There isn't as much Geostorm in that movie as you would want. That was the right. big complaint. Because yeah. they fucked like, it up. Yeah. And no then, like... Like fucking Emmerich now like co writes movies with his composer and shit. Like they're both struggling to find the collaborator. I don't know why, don't know why they're get back doing together. it. Together. Anyway, the third person I want to talk about just briefly before we get into this movie Fox. is oh, Paul, well, Schneider. Paul Schneider. I mean, giving... Carrie Fox, shout out. Nice to see her. Right. Lovely performance. Giving Paul the performance Schneider. of the decade. Giving, a, in my opinion, yes. flooring performance. Yes. Incredible. What the fuck happened here? I, I oh, okay. What happened to Huge, this guy? humongous. Sidebar, because he is one of my guys he for the. He's 2000s. amazing. He's a genius, and it just George felt like it was build, 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 build. All build. the real girls, right? He's, right. he's, he's one he's, of the David Gordon Green. He's David Gordon Green, much like Danny McBride. He has a David Gordon Green uh, a classmate at North Carolina School of the Arts who has no intention of becoming an actor. He wrote all the real girls. Yes. with David Gordon. But Green. Gordon puts Gordon Green puts him and McBride on camera in George Washington. And both of them are so good that he gives them bigger parts than all the real girls. He co-writes it with Schneider. And then that becomes a calling card. And then it's like, I know you detest Elizabeth Town, but he is very good in that. He's, he's, he's totally fine. Very good in Family Stone. He's like building up he's in these good big in, ensemble um, casts. Uh, Jesse James. He's, my Great friend, he is James. incredible in Jesse Yeah. James. And then he is so fucking good holding his own against people who are just like, I guess he's in so Lars. intense. He's in Lars and the real girl. Is he he's kind of great the, in that. Is he kind of the straight man? He's the brother-in-law. Yeah. But he is so fucking like, that is such a good normal guy performance. That right. kind of thing I talk about being so difficult where it's like, this guy's just fucking normal. He's just like a steady dude. He's so good at that. And then he gets cast on Parks and Recreation. Mm -hmm. The year this comes out. Right, and you're like, wow, this will be the thing that escalates him. He's going to be remember... the fucking straight man on this. The yeah, new he'll office. be Krasinski, right? But right. I just remember thinking when he got that role, I was like, damn, Parks got one yep. of the like most Huge. promising actors of the generation. Right. Since then, he's not given one film performance that's registered with me at all. No. Now, this is what's weirdest about I it. Will, I will. I do want to say I did see him in Straight White Men on Broadway. Okay, uh, which was with uh, Army Hammer. Is that guy been in the news recently? And mm -hmm. uh, wasn't I don't there know who someone? That is. <laughs> there was someone. It was like one of those uh, Broadway dramas yes. where they like they just built the cast out all famous to to, to sell tickets, right? Um, Josh Charles, right? Right. And he was really good. And I was like, Paul Schneider, he's still good, but 
he stopped being in movies. Now, what do you want okay. to say? What I was going to say is, I mean, first of all, he, uh, you know, when he's on this meteoric rise as a character actor is like, you don't understand. I never intended to be an actor. This right. wasn't my ambition. I don't think of myself as an actor. I really want to direct. I'm going back to directing. 2008, he writes and directs his movie that makes no impact whatsoever. He yeah, does well, a it's, it's a Pretty Bird, I yeah. think it's called. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's right before this and, and kind of concurrent with the Parks and Rec first season premiering, right? Then Parks and Rec premieres. I am in a minority where I like the first season of Parks and Rec more uh-huh. than what the show becomes after that. Wow. I've always that, that's quite the minority. I'm aware. I know, Although I, I'm not Don, aware. I'm Sam Donsky guy. once wrote a great piece about that for Grantland great about guy. like America's hottest writer. One of one of our great writers. Shout out yeah. Sam Donsky if you're listening, Sam. Yeah. You're so and I cute. Always, I miss you. The best <laughs> from Twitter. But I that really made me rethink it. And that was like yeah. when Park was Parks was hitting its stride, also of like it being super nice core, getting a ton of viewership. Right. Like season, Parks late season three, season four. Definitely. This is the thing. Struggles. I just right. I don't really care for what Parks and Rec becomes. No. No. I think it does feel too nice core and all this shit. They, whatever. Right. Like I like nice shit. Obviously, I fucking love the Paddington movies. But like. I I don't love what the show becomes. I don't think the first season is great, but I think by the end of it, I was like, huh, they're carving out an interesting thing here that's different than The Office. And he's great. And then great. I think they get... St- and he's great. And their dynamic he's is really interesting. He's really good in their dynamic. Really good. It's interesting in that first really season. Really good. Right? And, and then, then immediately th- gets sidebarred. The show gets right. too nice. It, it, she becomes too competent, too girl bossy, like all this sort of well, shit. Well, it's the, the Mike Sure problem of once he gets couples together, he's like... They're so nice together. I will right. do nothing to mess with this now. The like, show just becomes like all sweet. I don't know. Yeah. I, no, no, I, I really don't like. I never. I don't care parts. for it. I'm not claiming the first season is a, a masterpiece, but I like what it was intending to do and what it gets close to pulling off. Mm-hmm. And I like the Schneider in it. Mm-hmm. Schneider does that first season. Season two, he's clearly getting sidelined, right? He gets paired with Rashida Jones. Right. Mm. And that's sort of like a write-off. And now, like, Chris Pratt has been elevated. Chris Pratt's breaking out. His role is no longer Rashida Jones's, like, fucking ball and chain. Right. And he's becoming, like, breakout star. Right. Bright Star comes out. He's getting, like, critic awards. People are like, can he, won he the be... the National Society Film Critics Circle? Right. They're like, can he be the guy we will into a Best Supporting Actor nomination? The nomination doesn't happen. No. They announce he's leaving Parks and Rec. And the company line is, you know, his movie career is exploding now. Right. Like this Bright Star thing is huge. And it just, we both agreed the opportunities he's getting, he doesn't want to be kept here on this show. He always will be part of the firm of the show. We'll have him come Maybe back. Maybe he'll come back. He's right. being transferred he'll, he'll to he'll different do a divisions. Yeah. yeah. Right. And what happens is his film career completely flatlines. And when he does interviews years later, he was like, I was unceremoniously fired from that show and they never once offered to bring me back. That was this weird company line where they said, like, he will still exist in the universe. He's transferred divisions. He'll come back in. There was never any overture at any point in time. I would have done it. Right, right, right. Well, But, but it is bizarre that he does do stuff. Yeah, he's in stuff. But he's done some TV. Why has no one known how to use him for the last 12 years? I don't know. I don't know. He's so good. He's he's so good. uh, Part of what's amazing about this performance is that it's sort of just a normal guy performance in a period piece, which I think period pieces often forget to have, or they forget that just like people in the past were kind of normal also. Yes. And and it's a part that people could, that most people play so arch. What is so disarming about it is that he absolutely avoids the archetypes of how this type of guy is is played the in bore. terms of the narrative function mm-hmm. right right yes the problem yeah right right it's 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 a real like renoir like the great tragedy of the world is that everyone has question their reasons have yes. you ever seen this movie before no i had not right i thought i, remember, I thought i remember that this was yes. your first watch correct but you were aware that paul schneider was in it and you oh. had maybe heard me say that he like hits eight three-pointers no and i knew that and it's <laughs> like, like <laughs> that i'm like you don't understand this guy just absolutely pounds it it, it had been like a stupid blind spot of mine uh-huh. especially because i was so such yeah, a paul were, schneider fan you were for the last in... decade plus yeah he was the biggest appeal for me and i don't know why i never got around to seeing it can i just say like 10 years ago whatever it was um, my friend, uh, uh, Kamen Volkovsky, former uh, mm-hmm. trivia teammate of mm-hmm. ours, uh, who's a great, uh, AD has worked with some of the best directors, works with David Gordon Green all the time and all sorts of fucking rad people. He was on, he was the AD on a movie this year that was insane. And I forget what it was. Well, I'm going to look it up for you right yeah. now. Uh, the many, been doing, like, the many saints work. of Newark or Halloween kills. Well, he was second unit on those. Sure. Maybe it was both of those. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't he, know. He, 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 he is great. Dead. Don't die. He's pretty cool. He does. 
awesome stuff. Great. But uh, he was like, I'm going to go see Holy Motors with my friend. Do you want to come? Sure. And I like go see Holy Motors as I am often want to do. I am late and I get there right as the movie is like starting. So I like come in in the dark and like cozy up next to comment and watch this movie. Times, right? Yeah. Right. That is like uh, I believe that's how we met was me showing up late to Correct. a movie. Uh, and uh, we uh, I slide in there. I watch Holy Motors. F- fucking profound experience. Amazing movie. Lights come up and we're just like, holy shit, that thing is incredible. And then I look over and the friend next to him is Paul Schneider. Oh, my hey, God. Hey, Paul. Yes. And then Paul Schneider and I take the subway home together and talk about fucking movies and shit. And it was just like. This guy rules as much as I want him to. I'm such a fan of his. His entire perspective on acting and film and, like, his excitement over that movie is so infectious. And I'm like, this guy, right, this guy is the fucking best. He's the coolest guy. Right. And uh, that's the only time I ever met him. Sure. But even more so since then, at that point in time, I was like, huh, weird that Paul Schneider's been kind of laying low for the last three years. But then it doesn't seem so weird if it's just been a couple years since your last movie. Right. Yeah. And then the last nine years, I'm just like, what the fuck's going on here? Yeah, look, if you look at his thing, it's like he's been in some movies, although yes. really since Rules Don't Apply, which I forgot he's in that, right? Uh, which is 2016, he's only done a couple of films. He's done, since then, you know, he was in that move, that TV show Channel Zero that was the sort of like, um, uh, fuck, what's it called? Creepypasta show? Oh. Was that with the Tooth Man? The, the, I always there had was to see the, the Tooth, tooth man, man, and then they did Candle Co. They would, they sure. would do adaptations of famous creepypastas. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I forgot the two things that he's in. What was the in. other one you said? Candle? Uh, Candle Cove, which is sort of this idea of like, do you, don't you remember that we used to watch this disturbing TV show when we were kids? Oh, and then like and everyone's forgotten about it, but it's some show we watched. Oh, yeah. sure, okay. You know, classic creepypasta. I forgot that the two things he does after uh, Bright Star slash Parks and Rec Neither of which connect, but felt like they were on the path of his career as water a, for elephants. Where he's the superstructure. Yeah, he's the water. I don't. <laughs> I don't fucking know. The movie is told by, I believe, Hal Holbrook playing old Robert Pattinson, Correct. of course. Yeah. And Paul Schneider is the guy interviewing him. He's like the Bill Paxton of the Titanic. Hal Holbrook is actually a time traveler, and he is actually old Robert Pattinson. Of course. Yeah. Um, and then away we go. He tended it himself. Fuck it. Sorry. Away we go felt like, oh, Paul Schneider's playing one of the fucking relatives. Like he probably kills it in three scenes. And then that movie just doesn't exist, doesn't connect. Yeah, the only movie the thing that movie killed was quality. But right, he like does the <laughs> baby makers. Oh, smile. Okay. <laughs> he does the baby makers. Away he went. Which is a Jay Chandrick Sakar movie with him and Olivia Munn. He does Flowers of War, which is that hugely expensive. Uh, isn't it Zhang Yimou? Yeah, that like doesn't connect. Yep. Uh, Christian Bale and uh, right yeah, Cafe yeah. Society. He's got a big role in Rules Don't Apply. He's got a fairly big role in, but both of those movies are huge flops. Yeah. That's uh it. yeah. You know, he was in uh three episodes of Nos Four Ah Two. Five David's episodes spelling of out. Tales from the Loop. <laughs> well, was... the, the license plate. Sure, which we've talked about not existing. Two episodes yeah. of assassination yeah. of Gianni Look, Versace. I, I it bums me out simply because I think he's a very talented guy and this performance is so special to me. Here's another Think thing about, about this performance. Mm. You're just like, and I, I had heard for over a decade that he was amazing in this. Mm-hmm. You're just like, there's no way he's going to pull off the Irish accent. He's got such a specific Southern drawl, Paul Schneider, mm-hmm. and he can sort of shut it off and do like low energy, like mid-Atlantic, right? But you're just like, Irish is tough. Most American actors who have tried to do Irish really embarrass themselves. Like it fucking demolished Cruz and Kidman, who's Australian, right? Mm-hmm. His accent's so fucking good. It's amazing. His accent's great. Um, so good. But it's as Fran said, there is like something modern about his performance Very. that maybe shouldn't work, but totally does. I yeah, guess. because I mean, yeah. he's playing a boorish character, but he's yes. also showing why some people like hanging out with boorish people. Yes. He's not completely repulsive. He's I like, find him pretty seductive. At he's it. like yes. playing a trust fund kid. He's a yeah. fairly good Who's like hang, not bad intention, all, but is mad. He's the guy that when your friend is like, ah, you're like, I know, but you know, he's fun. He's or, like, actually, know, like, he's not a bad guy if you get to know him. This right, is a exactly. movie about having a boyfriend with a roommate. Yeah. And like that roommate could be anything. <laughs> so this movie, it's directed by Jane Campion. She also wrote it. Mm-hmm. It's called Bright Star mm-hmm. after one of John Keats's poems. It's about mm-hmm. the poet John Keats. Mm-hmm. Do you know John Keats? Died young. 
died young. Who died young. Famously died young. Live at the sad, age of 25. Young. He did live sad. He did die young. Yolo um, vibes. Romantic poet. Classic romantic poet. Probably the most classic in that he had this tragic life and death. Sure. There's Byron. Well, there's obviously Shelley. Got Percy Shelley also died super young, too, he, I think. He, he's crazy. Yeah. He's a crazy guy, that guy. Well, he Byron, died at sea, which is quite romantic. Well, mm. I was reading something that said he died holding on to a Keats poem that there was one like were, in his jacket look, they, they were, were really close. that he kept with him always well, and then drowned with I it. will say well, I was it poem in your pocket day than when he died hmm? was it poem in your pocket day when he died yeah, yeah it was poem do you folks remember that did you no. ever do that in school what? what no I don't know what you're talking it's like, about it's like, <laughs> you're kidding. it's one of these things that I feel like whatever like poetry association has tried to make like an informal holiday for like 25 years and it's never really connected yeah where they're like, you don't know that like April 23rd is poem in your pocket day and you're supposed to carry a poem in your pocket to like reassert the power of poetry. Huh. I, I remember my school pushing carry, it like, on me once or twice. Milton, you know. I mean, Paradise I went to lost, the whole book. Yeah. <laughs> you carry the yeah. Whole. So Jane Camp. It's a heavy pocket. Yeah. Let's give, let me give you a little. Obviously, she does in the cut and then takes a sabbatical mm-hmm. from filmmaking, partly cool wounded movie. by the poor reception of the film. Just that it's it just doesn't really get a shot. It doesn't get a fair shake. But also partly because she's got a nine year old kid and sure. she's like, I've been doing this. Um and uh, apparently she got into meditation. Mm. Uh she made a couple of short films, something called The Water Diary, that's in a series called Eight. Okay. That had like Gaspar Noé, Gus Van Sant. I don't never heard uh-huh. of that. Uh and something called The Ladybug, which is part of To Each His Own Cinema. Okay. IMDB entry classic where you're always yes. like, what's this other movie this director? Oh, it's oh, a right. massive anthology yeah. film. Um that's how she meets Greg Frazier and Mark Bradshaw, who she collaborates on this movie. Greg okay. Frazier, obviously, who I think is one of the top directors of photography working today. Mm-hmm. But this is maybe this is his first particularly this is his first movie really this is his breakout yeah, yeah. i mean he'd made little movies before them but uh he, with you know this movie is so beautifully shot of course he shot dune last year he's mm-hmm. shooting the batman this year like he has graduated mm-hmm. to like the dp everyone wants zero dark 30 a Great. shot mandalorian and rogue mm-hmm. one um so that's fox she- catcher which is a beautiful looking movie oh, yeah. telling them softly where's yeah. he when she does who, where's, where's who? who bennett Not miller fox- chilling yeah. Is he like a villain, he we was need recently. Him back. He was yeah. recently papped with Channing. They had lunch in Soho or need something. Him. Cool, cool thing to do. First of all, seriously, uh, we need him back. He has been working on. Fuck, I looked it up because Fox Foxcatcher was like ten years in the making, and the only reason he made movies sooner was because Moneyball got thrown to him. But he mm-hmm. takes a long time fucking developing. Shit. Just He's because those... we're on topic, one of my close friends back in Chicago uh, once did one of the more deranged double features of mm. Paddington and Foxcatcher, just back to back. And is always like, this is the weirdest day of my yeah. life. Cool thing to do. Ben uh, and Miller, he's one of those guys who's basically like, I don't like this enough to do it all the time. Like, it's a right. lot for me. So I take I, my, I think he's, he's trying to get a Christmas Carol made. Right. He's, he's long doing had like a, a Christmas very, Carol project. Right. right. But I think he's doing like a very sober. I believe that's grounded. the idea. It would be a very realistic okay. or something. I don't right. know. But anyway, but it's one of those things that like God knows if he's actually still working on sure. that or if that's just the last thing he was trying to make. I up. think he's also one of those guys who surprisingly does pretty anonymous TV commercials for a lot of money. Well, Good for him. Gotta like make a where where you just be like, oh, he does the Lexus campaign. I hope Channing Tatum showed him Dog. Channing Tatum has a film called Dog coming yes. out that oh, he directed. I know. Right. And I recently saw a quote from Soderbergh that was like, I saw it, it's good. And yeah. one other Tatum collaborator was like, yeah. yeah, I gave him some notes. I hope he showed it to Ben. I'm Miller excited. Well. I'm really excited. But like I I like James Gray does a weird amount of like Revlon ads. Sure, sure. Where mm-hmm. it's just a movie star being like, What's my secret? And you're like, this is just shot by a photographer. Like, the, the, anyone could do this. There's no narrative. I think Bennett Miller does a lot of that type of shit. And doesn't he date an Olsen twin? I don't know. Maybe. I okay, um, cool. think he does. Uh, I can look it up for you. I think he dates the one who is not. He dated Ashley Olsen. Are they not still together? Not seeing anything post like 2014 about this. So I don't okay. know. Okay. But they definitely in dated the money at ball some era, point. Though. She was in her late yeah. 20s. He was in his 40s. Sort of his muse. Uh, for Moneyball. She was his friend. <laughs> um, while she's making in the cut, Jane Campion reads Andrew Motion's 
um, biography Keats. A yeah. Biography. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so she gets, she says, I'm not like a poetry expert, but I'm very drawn to this relationship he had and these mm. letters they wrote each other. Sure. With Fanny Brown. Which are not published until after she dies, her kids published. Right. Right. Um, so she's sort of like, re- that resonates with her. Uh, so she's thinking about that. She wants to make a movie about younger people. That's interesting mm. to her. Suddenly mm-hmm. it's like, oh, they're in their early 20s. That's why Greg Frazier is in his 20s. Mark Andrews is in it. Like she's collaborating sure. with younger people. So she, maybe and she's, she's got a, a, she's got a younger a daughter. Reboot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. She's seeing things through a younger person's eyes again, maybe. Yeah. That she's got her younger daughter, who right. I believe she homeschooled at least for a little while. Uh huh. And um, she was in some of those short films, I think. Possibly, sure. Right. That makes right. sense. I guess when she starts acting. Yeah. Um, Anyway, is Ginger and Roses the same year as this, the year after, which is Alice's 2012. So it's a couple film. years later. Okay. Okay. I have no sense of time anymore. Um, anyway, so she's doing tons and tons of research. So that's mm-hmm. another reason this takes a while. She did say, I was drawn to Percy Shelley as well mm-hmm. because he's got a crazy story. Um, but uh, with Keats, she liked that there's innocence and purity with his story, that he was so sweet. He was uh, inquiring. He was interesting. He was a passionate friend. I think she was sort of interested in making a non-sexy movie that's still romantic, but isn't... It's sort of defined by its chastity in a right, way. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was uh, not as daring in yeah. its sexual content. Um, it's dongless. I mean, we should just say it is a movie. dongless film. Um but basically, you know, I just feel like she's sort of semi-consciously, semi-unconsciously swerving away from sure. her last couple of movies, right? Sure. Now, you... Yes. No, I agree. Now, I just want to say, because uh, I had never seen this film before, uh, I am, you know, famously uh, bad at time management, infamously bad at time management. And uh, Wait, my... I'm sorry. I was just in the other room. What? What, 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 what? what, was, what, was just what are you talking said? about? You? Did you watch this on 1.5 speed or something? No, I did. Oh, okay. I did. I did. <laughs> I swear to God. It wasn't that bad, okay. but my plan was to watch this uh, last night. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, all right. Okay. So I said this to Fran in the car while we were driving up. I was so worried about this. Yeah. Because yesterday you and Ben watched all four Jackass movies. We went to a Jackass a thon where we sat in a theater at the Museum Moving Image and watched all four Jackass movies and then a, a q I didn't ask Griffin this. Yeah. But I was thinking. Because I know you like to watch the movie. I'm not blaming you, but like it would have been wise, probably. Oh, face from Fran. If one of the two of you texted me on Tuesday or Wednesday and said, "Like you should watch this before the Jackass marathon," I'm not blaming you. Nor should you. It would have been to the (laughs) benefit of the show because I watched four Jackass movies. Then Ben and I got dinner, and then I went home and I tried to watch Bright Star, and I was like, I cannot adjust to nine. Yeah, that's insane, Griffin. No shit. Right. I was. I I had to watch Jackass 2.5 in order to fall asleep because I was like, Jackass is the only thing I understand now. So then I woke up early and watched this. Okay. Well, I mean, I was just afraid you weren't going to pull that off. I was assuming that was your plan all along. I did pull it off, but I was just like, this is a a dreamy movie. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm like watching a drinking coffee being like, okay, come on. You know, I like maybe was less alert than I wanted to be for a movie that very much lulls you. Here's my advice. Yep. Don't watch the movie day of. I know you say that, but my fresh takes yeah. the fresh takes. Anyway. <laughs> but sometimes things like days later hit you in the shower or something. Sure. You know? That's Look, true. I, that I tried not to watch it day of. I tried to watch it last night and I was like... <laughs> Where are the nut shots? What is this? Is not a movie. This is not how movies. We put a work. bunch of butterflies in a room. <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> um, so I am Keats. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm John, John Keats. Keats. I mean, you look. The butterfly farm, in fact, is one of Campion's inventions. Okay, uh, she I, admits like there definitely was not a butterfly farm down there, sure. but mm-hmm. he liked butterflies and wrote about them. And I was like, there should be some butterflies. Yeah. Cool thing to do. Um. Uh, but but obviously this is also post Holy Smoke and In the Cut, which are contemporary films. Her sure. returning right. to beautifully costumed films, and boy, is it beautifully costumed! Don't you agree, Ben? Absolutely. Uh, I don't remember the name of the, that's character, only... of the character, but she's Fanny? like a seamstress. Fanny, Fanny is an inc- has incredible looks. She does, and people are mean about them. You know, all yeah. these poets are like, "Oh, you make clothes." You know, she they're, does they're a look little sort snowy. of like Mad Hatter, White Rabbit in that first scene, and then it's kind of all normal from there. But, but the movie no, starts with her loudest outfit. Yes. I would say I that do red. like her outfit, and it is yeah. sort of like her outfits are always ten percent louder than what everyone else is wearing, yeah. especially totally. the women, right? Yeah. Like you know, you definitely are always noticing like, oh, she's like a little avant-garde or whatever. Her yeah. hat game, like the hat, the hat game, hat. is crazy. Yeah. 
I mean, you do always in in the way where like I think all these characters are made to feel very normal in a period setting. I think having a friend who's always showing up in one insane accessory, yeah, right. the Ben, for instance, you know, sure, like that's a normal thing to have. She also like much like Ben does with his closest friends when she meets him is like, you should really be wearing velvet and like a darker blue would look good on you. <laughs> Ben is always trying to give you an eye fashion advice. He wants to, like, restyle us. I got to tell you some news that just came down the wires. It's really good news. Okay. David Lynch has joined the cast of Steven Spielberg's upcoming film, The Fablemans. What? Isn't that cool? That rules? Undisclosed, guarded, secret role. Wow. Anyway. Isn't that the best? Isn't this movie going to be the best movie And it's Friday, too. That's true. That's great news. (laughs) TGIF. That just broke. Uh, Anyway. Okay. Uh, Fanny does throw some great looks. We'll talk about that. Yeah. So she puts the money together with and this. Pate. Is of course that's the only Oscar nomination this movie gets. Yeah, costume costume. It's sort of an Janet undeniable Patterson. Oscar nomination. It doesn't nomination. win, does it? And then no. this is Janet Patterson's last credible for she passes away. I mm, good question. We we shouted her out in a previous episode, but most of her career is campion. She does very few films outside right. of campion. She was both the costumer and the production designer yes. of this film, and, and was she, like fairly reclusive. Never did interviews. Never went to award shows. She no. She, it's not. Her last film, because she actually uh, did the costumes for the wonderful Far From the Madding Crowd. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, what Hell yes. Thomas I love that Vinterberg. Thomas Vinterberg's Far From the Madding That's Crowd, which my, rules. I love that movie. That's my insane double feature where I saw that and Age of Ultron in the same day. Wow. She's going to have a stroke. Um, I love that movie. Wow. Uh, she died in 2016, but obviously, as we said, right, she rarely Oh, she I didn't realize worked. that. Yeah. Madding um, Crowd reminds me a lot of this movie. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, it's so okay. I mean, a little bit. Well, I mean, was that good and Schoenarts and Mulligan? Correct. Okay. Um, good? Matthew Good? No, it's, no, well, it's Schoenarts, though. It's right. Michael Sheen, oh, Schoenarts, right. and then. Uh, Carrie Mulligan. Carrie Mulligan, and then. Oh, Tom, Tom Sturridge. Tom Sturridge. Remember Is him? Matthew Good not in that? Am I wrong? No. Not even a supporting What am I confusing no that good. with? Something Nothing else at that good. time. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, you do have Juno Temple, three. though, your favorite. Oh, yeah. Gina. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, it's I a movie about having time. three boyfriends. The young Victoria Sandy Powell beat it. Lame. Anyway. Weird. Uh, T- two apparition costume nominations. As I was going to say, this That's film, what crippled them. You know? And they're out of Put together yeah. some like, money. Two, campa- <laughs> two costume campaigns they thought would yeah. translate the box office. Pathé and BBC funded it. Apparition mm-hmm. released it for some reason. Okay. This film. Okay. So. I was confusing with Brides Head Revisited. Anyway, oh, that's ben the one that good is in. Okay. Far from the Madding Crowd, one of the greatest scores. Greg Armstrong. Oh, so good. Incredible score. No, I got to rewatch. If, great. Anyway, Tom Hardy, just a bit more of a bummer. You know, he his, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> Thomas Hardy. Not, not like Tom Bane. Hardy, Thomas the actor. Hardy, Thomas yeah. Hardy. Tom Hardy's a great author. time. Yeah, he is a great time. He's a party day. He should do a Tom Thomas Hardy adaptation, though. Yeah. Hardy and Hardy. I wonder the Hardy if Boys. he has. Because he used so. to do BBC stuff for a second. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Bright Ooh, star. Be so good. So I grew up in England. Beyond that, what? I grew up in North London. Beyond that, what? I actually grew up in Kentish Town, which hilariously in Bright Star is the sort of slum he moves to when he can't afford the the old. Residence. Oh, where he goes to dive. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, oh, Kentish Town is all I can afford, and I'm like, damn, Kentish Town is, cleaned is up. Is there a, um, <laughs> a good t- a dying town around? I mean, Kentish Town is a little more of a sort of like. Well, I mean, these days I think it's pretty fancy, but when I lived there, it was a little more, you know, mm-hmm. sort of fringy. But uh, anyway, Got it. Uh, but Kentish Town very near Hampstead Heath where okay. most of this movie takes place. Sure. And a classic walk that I did one billion times mm-hmm. was you can go in the Heath, and it's like, where are we going to go? You can go to Kenwood, which is like yeah. a big old house. Yeah. You can go over there, South and Green, and get, get a cookie, maybe. Mm-hmm. I would do that a lot. Or you could go to get Keith's house. Or you're saying, you mean oh, biscuit. You can go to Keith's house. You can go to Keith's house, which okay. is where this movie takes place. Yeah. Now, they did not shoot it there. Because it's too small, I think Campion was like, this is like... Sure. So they shot it actually in this estate sort of just outside of London. But okay. you can go to Keats' house, which yeah. is where this motherfucker lived and was flirting up a storm with Fanny. Uh, Sarah Finowich and I once got lost in Hempstead Heath for like three hours. It's my it's my favorite park. But like the sun had set and we like really oh, didn't know how to there. get out. Ooh, it's Ooh, a little scary. nasty. You don't want to be in there tonight. No, Wait. Yeah. no. And we could not find our way out. We're both very easily confused men. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> it's not great when we're together without adult supervision. <laughs> what were you going to ask? So when they're in Hampstead Heath and he's like, I have to go into London for this, how long is that taking them? I think given that this film is set in what, 18, 18 or whatever, I think back then, you know, 
like Hampstead, obviously Hampstead now is basically almost inner London, but at the time it would have been like 20 minutes to half an hour in a freaking cart or whatever. Okay, right? okay, you know, like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like know. Astoria. Sure. sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hampstead, obviously, very, very fancy neighborhood now. But yeah, sure. back then, you know, it was like... It's well, when they're just the like, you know, he commuted back from London in the rain. It's like, okay, is this half a day he's spending in the rain or it's Look, 20 minutes? I, I he's a big baby. I don't know how okay. long it takes in a goddamn horse. Just, this is the problem. Okay. I don't have horse speed. I mean, you know... And was he not under the covered part? Was that the issue? I think he walked. He just Oh, walked. if he's walking, that's a pretty yeah. long walk. That's also, what I'm I mean, saying. Like, if he's walking that... To how much central time? London? Sure. That's, that's, that's a couple hours yeah. at yeah. least walking. Okay, yeah. I guess I'd get tuberculosis too. But even if he was under the... <laughs> I'm John Keats and this is uh, getting severely co- <laughs> yeah. cold. This is getting way too cold. <laughs> and also, this they're is also they're the wearing all this like, suede and velvet. It's just sucking the water know. in. You know? Know. Like, it's only just going to mold you up, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Hampstead Heath. So you've been in Hampstead Heath. It's this gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous, like, you know, untamed park in yes. middle of London. It's yes. massive. Right. It's like It's like a wild kind of undeveloped central park it's so right? good yes uh and it's my favorite spot and it's yep. so nice to see it that's one reason i love this movie but i also just it's keith's house it's worth visiting if no one's been it's lovely to visit and then of course if you're in rome you can visit the keith's house there where he died mm. have any of you ever done that no no because obviously he went there to you know supposedly warmer weather you'll convalesce and that's yeah. where he dies and it happens off screen in this movie did that help in the past when they were like you got to go to italy to cure your disease i mean italy seems like a nice place to go maybe it cheer you I get, up I, well, I don't know yeah i don't know this is i've been rereading some I mean, it's like very you know you needed to breathe right so maybe they were just i don't i don't know, you know i've been reading some ferrantes and they love mm. to be like oh you got to go to the beach and that'll fix all your issues and i'm sure. like do some we know that, that works or is it just sort of like yeah go on vacation you're sad look i had a lot of this movie triggered a lot of uh, uh existential uh sort of uh, jags of thought for me and one of them, and this is not the first time I've I've had this observation, realization, I should say. But watching this movie, I was like, right. I, before modern medicine, I would have been dead by 25. Oh, like, sure. <laughs> you, you, you would have, something would have knocked right, you like off. Right, like John Keats, you're like tragically dies at 25. What happened? Was there an accident? No. Did you see this guy? This guy was so fragile. There's like. <laughs> Knock him over with a feather. Right, right. He is not like survival of the fittest. This guy is not. Built we didn't know to about be able vitamin D. The we didn't know about hydration. Right. You don't. You don't have fucking like uh, I don't know North Face jackets and shit. I you just, know. I just want to reflect. It, it's. I was just talking about this with my wife last night after watching Bright Star for the like tenth time. My point is just something like go get some sunlight. Is like I don't know. That's a fucking. It can't make it oh, worse. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, 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 yeah. Why not? Or who <laughs> right. you know, like, who's what fucking right. yeah. Yeah, breathe, breathe the guy's, ocean in. Guy's like, like, on his bones. I want that doctor now. Who's like, I'm sorry, I have to prescribe you going to Italy <laughs> right. to sure. fix what's wrong with you. Yeah. You hand it to like Delta and they're like, okay, all in order. You're yeah. in first class. <laughs> like, what can I tell you? Um, my mom, I would walk with my mom in Hampstead Heath a ton. Because she, <laughs> whoa, you know, when I'm a teenager or younger, yeah. but you know, it'd be like, like, let's fucking take a walk, you know, kind of her thing. I'll just like, come on, like, mm-hmm. you're not sitting around the house all day. Right. And I just think now, and like I remember, she'd be like, "Where do you want to go?" And I would be like, "I want to go to HMV, like, because you sure. could exit Hampstead Heath, you yep. could walk up the hill to Hampstead, and you, I could go to a record store." Mm-hmm. They're like, and she'd be like, "You know, so sometimes maybe I get to do that, but often we'd fucking go to Keith's house or something, right?" Sure. And I just remember when I was a teenager, I was like. I don't want to go, you know, stupid poetry house for like the hundredth time. <laughs> it's like a four room museum. They're like, John Keats still lived here. You know, cool. Yeah. No news. <laughs> like, yeah. But it's a lovely little spot. Sure. And now I'm like, it's so enriching that I did. You know, what a I good know. thing for me to have done, you know, to fucking look. Did you thought proclaim about... when you were there ever? Did I, you go, I... oh, it's this branch. So beautiful, you know, like, did you... I should have done more of that, yeah. probably, like, instead of thinking about video games I wanted to buy David, or whatever. you and I both grew up with very cultural parents, right? Yeah, sure. Who I imagine, you similarly had a childhood of them constantly trying to, like, expose you to things. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Sure, and I yeah, just, right. much like you, like, it's a, a, an absurdly privileged position, right, to live in a place where you have access to this and parents lovely, who, like, city, try to expose you to these things. things. And right. I also just had such fucking frustration with, like, you're making me look at some other fucking old dude's house again. I don't care about that. I mean, shit. to be clear, I do was I a, get to go to the toy store afterwards? You want to go Am to I going to get to see Charlie's right. Angels afterwards? I wanted to see, I also wanted to see, but, like, <laughs> right. to be clear, I was a good boy and I would. 
you know, but I, but I remember that I would be a little stick in the mud yeah, about it. Yeah. But I will say, and I love Keats House in London, and anyone who's in London should check it out. It's a lovely spot. Mm-hmm. But I just want to say, Keats House in Rome, where he died, yes, is like maybe my like favorite, or like one of those places that has had the biggest emotional impact. It is crazy. Really? Because uh, it's so small. Yeah. It's in this gorgeous, it's right on the Spanish steps. Like it's in a gorgeous part of the city. Mm-hmm. And you just go in there and it's so quiet. And there's this little bed where he died. I'm like... I'm feeling it just thinking about it. And you're just like, he thought he was a failure and he just died. Yeah. It's so crazy. Like he just was just like, nobody gives a shit about me. You know, it's so sad. And he was like the greatest. Yeah. And you're just, when you're in there and it's all content, you're just like, this is insane. Like that this happened this way and it's perfectly like maintained and shit. And then they're like, and when the Nazis fucking invaded, we had to hide all his shit so they wouldn't like burn it. You know, like it's such a good museum. I, and I, you just think yeah. about John Keats. It's crazy. I mean, look, I'm such a fucking sap. Yep. And it's some of the corniest content in the world. He's 25 years old. I'm 35. I got 10 years on John Keats. What do I got a show for it? A podcast with Griffin Newman? You think he'd like that? Unbelievable. Uh, but no, <laughs> I would say like it. He might. Maybe he would. Oh, jolly good. That's what he'd say. Someone to listen to and he's walking back in the rain, you know, What's, suffering, what, laughing. Who is Qui-Gon Jin? <laughs> I mean, he probably loves kissing. I mean, he definitely does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. kissing. Yeah. kissing. Yeah. There's nothing else Absolutely. we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I was just going to say they're the two... I think they're the only two, and I think he wrote both of them. Richard Curtis, Doctor Who episodes. The the Van Gogh one. And what, Charles Dickens. Yeah, sure, right. Where both of them, he does the beat both times, and both times it's effective, where the guy's oh. like, nothing I do fucking matters. And Doctor Who, like, tells them, like, you don't understand. Like, the one, like, the Van Gogh thing where the whole episode's him and, like, the well, final They take him to the museum, and it's like... Bill Nye is, like, the curator, right. and he's giving the thing, and he shows him, like, the appreciation for his work, and Van Gogh realizes his life is not meaningless. And with the Dickens one, he, like, tells him, he's like, just tell me one thing. Like, does my work last? And then Doctor Who gives him the fucking romantic Curtis monologue about how much his work matters forever. And in both cases, it's, like, beautiful. And this is a movie that is, like, full of profound tragedy of the guy just never getting to know, obviously. He doesn't know. Like, fucking Curtis wants to give you the corny Doctor Who thing where the guy gets to find out and doesn't die suffering, you know? I hope the Richard Curtis Dickens doesn't find out about the people in my MFA program. In who were pitched reading Dickens, who said, "Who gives a shit?" Um, he's sure, got to sure. not find out about. He that. doesn't right. find that out. Do you think Dickens would be into cancel culture? <laughs> well, they they came for him. You can't cancel me. I'm just trying they to. Came for, it was one of the big him fights. Him being on Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> These motherfuckers are trying to cancel me. I wrote Oliver Twist. It was one of our big MFA fights with the poets and the sure, fiction people. Is, like, is, what, is what is the point of still reading Dickens? Yeah, because it's fucking rocks the house. It was an MFA so fight good. that almost turned to an MMA fight. Right. That's right. Like, <laughs> That's right. I mean, I love Bleak House. I'm a big Bleak House stan. Bleak House rules the first detective story ever written. Inspector Bucket. Mm. Yeah. Um. Anyway, we're not yes. here to talk Dickens. No, no. I, I was just saying. As much as I love the man. Th- this is a Dickens movie. Dickens miniseries? This is a movie that has the cloud of his franchise. This is a movie that has the cloud of the sort of like, he's never going to get to now. Right? Right. Absolutely. Uh, of course. And and this relationship is going to remain unfulfilled. And, and his well, life and was all about you know, promise. And, I think for most people watching the movie, you know that he died at 25. So the whole movie has this kind of like ticking time bomb so it's much melancholy. of his legacy right. yeah he, and he's a sweet guy who's doing a silly dance for his pals for sangster yeah for he's sangster giving sangster some have fun have you guys talked about him on the show i don't know if we've had a sangster i wrote that swerve, in my notes he was segue. supposed to play tintin which sure i feel was. is the only time we would have invoked sangster him. section we certainly invoked him briefly at least right i love that guy um well we have not yet been welcome to the scorch but no, I don't know. Maybe we do that <laughs> on Patreon. Loves, he brings up the Maze Runner so often. I've as, only like, seen the third one. Secretly, third one whips. is the worst one. I know you say that every time we talk one, about two, this. One, two, three. Right, Scorch Trials <laughs> that's, that's where it's at. Yeah. That's how I should rank more. It's not that you rank them in order. You just do a noise pyramid. Yeah, <laughs> really. My Jackass ratings are like one, two, three, four. You know, or whatever. Yeah, I don't know, but you know. four is still great. Anyway. No, I think it's, I'm actually two, three, two, four, three, one. I think I might give three the slight edge, but I do think one's the worst now. But I don't know. In retrospect, did you watch three in 3D? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Uh, Yeah, it was great to see it in 3D. It is still, for my money, maybe the best use of 3D. Top use of 3D post Avatar. It's that and and Coraline. Anyway, Ben. Griffin. The seasons, they may be undecided. 
Sure. Here in New York, it's been wacky. It's been cuckoo. It was like 65 degrees yesterday. I know. It's going right. to snow soon. I know. It's, yep. And then it was like raining and everything. It's been all over the place. I'll tell you one thing I'm decided on. Comfort. You love comfort. It's consistency. For me, it's a through line. It's what I care about the most in this world, maybe, is I the right the right to comfort. And you know what? For all. You know what has really comfort? I want everyone to have comfort. What? Comfortable products. Comfortable products. Brooklinen. And here's the thing I'm going to say to the people who are listening to the podcast right now. You could, I'm talking to you, save on Brooklinen's five-star collection of cozy essentials to lounge your way right through the long weekend, the short weekend, the short week, the long week. This the is cold applicable. Week, the, the hot cold, week, the hot week, the mid. I would say the Brooklyn stuff, it's got range, baby. Okay. You save on all the comforts you crave. There's no better time than now to step up your comfort. You wrap up a Brooklyn signature sheets and see exactly what those 100,000 five star reviews about. And they got a, an award winning lineup of home essentials to keep you comfy around the clock. Okay. Now, here's the thing, though home sweet home. Gets even sweeter sweet. when you got some sweet, sweet sheets that are comfy and wow. just feel nice on your skin. But not just bedding, obviously. We got loungewear, we got of towels, course. we got bath mats, candles, all these things. You know, yeah. what I like to do is I like to sleep in slash on Brooklyn. Me too. What I don't like to do is sleep on savings. Okay. So, oh, unfortunately, you just missed the President's Day sale. There was a Brooklyn President's Day sale. It ended. You missed it. Doesn't matter. You know why? Mm-mm. Because you can Me? still get the deal. Yes, you, Marie, and everyone else listening out here can still get the deal of your dreams at brooklyn.com with the promo code blank check. We've had promo code blank. We've had promo code check. This is promo code blank check. No spaces. All lowercase. It's essentially an evergreen President's Day deal. That's right. So that is uh, B R O O K L I N E N dot com. Promo code blank check. Get comfy. The other thing this movie is fundamentally about for me, right? There's the sort of like unfulfilled promise, the tragic doomed romance, all these things that are like cornerstones of, you know, period romance and these kinds of like, uh, you know, Un, unrecognized in their time artists, biopics, and whatever. But the other thing I think this movie is very, very keenly tied into, and it's much more like textually grounded in than than most other films of this kind. And I say this as someone who has benefited from countless forms of privilege of various mm, um, ilks sure, sure. Uh, and has been given so many career advantages because of that. This is a movie about how fucking difficult if not impossible it is to be an artist if you're born poor and without social status which is a thing that still is fucking discussed today in our culture where it's just like how do you have the room to struggle and find your own voice if you do not have the means to survive you know Mm. and it's like there are exceptions and then they become like sort of like heroic stories of like look you can do it you can come from dirt and build yourself and become a canonical artist but those people always do just have good luck on their side like they get the fucking lottery ticket at some point mm. and here's a guy who had like a roommate who's essentially like a trust fund kid who's like I'm executive producer I'm like making shit happen I'm like working stuff and then his like heartbreaking scene at the end of the movie is like say it I failed Keats well, that's. I didn't fucking figure crazy. out how to make him crazy. into a thing. He wound himself I around. Mean, my I'm sorry. Heart. I'm fucking it's sorry. I have failed and, him. And even his romance is fucking ruined by the fact that everyone's like, "There's no money here between the two of you. You can't fucking do this." Yeah. You can't fucking do this. He can't waste his time in a romance that he can't support. It takes away from his writing, and he can't support you. So it's a waste of your time to be with him. And it's just like the whole movie is so wrapped up in the class struggle of just like. Everyone just being like, look, this is like nice. It's a nice idea you have, but like you're not going to be able to pull this off. It's such an anvil drop once they're like, you can marry our fanny because it's like they all know where this is going. Right. You might as well let him have this sort of like, I don't know. I guess just fucking go with it together. Like you can struggle together. Um, Yeah. And, And then even more so at a time where a guy like this just like genuinely just cannot survive against the elements. Yeah. Against nature. You know, you're just like, this guy's going to fucking catch something at some point. He's going to go out for milk and like <laughs> fucking get gangrene, you know, whatever. Uh, poor guy. Um, 
he yeah this movie is i would say fairly plot light uh it's kind of a hangout movie it's mostly like what if you lived in the same house as john keats kind of and wouldn't you fall in love with him or live near him at least yeah Mm -hmm. their their romance doesn't have like rom-com structure no to it it's really just a series of conversations where they seem genuinely curious and interested in each right. other. There's the one moment early on where Charles Brown, who's Scottish, by the way, I had to triple check. Oh, but it's okay. A Scottish sorry, accent, sorry, not an Irish accent. sorry. But Brown is always Scottish. Sure. Um, but he he does he does a a, a feather light brogue. Yeah, no, for sure. You but know? where Bra- where Brown gives her the the fake love letter. Yes. And, she, and he's like, well, do you love him? Like you know, like you know that that's the only rom com moment, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. Right? Is the sort of. Where Brown's like, it was in jest, you know. Like do you I was think just it, fucking with you. Do you read that as a joke in the movie? I think that he is being who he is, which is sort of a sort of like, I'll just start some shit. Maybe she has See, a crush I, on me, or maybe I, I always read that as earnest of I, him. If he's like, mm-hmm. maybe I'll like, shoot my shot. Yeah, but it's like earnest with the the caveat of like, I can just say I was joking. Yeah, that's right, my right, vibe. Yes, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Like, you know, I can just be myself like can be the excuse sure. if, if it doesn't yeah. go over i don't know i mean it's also like they have their like awkward meet cute right she's like fucking spilling tea and there he like, opens the door too fast you wear Prank. that you know like all this sort of like but then the scene where sh- he finally sort of takes a liking to her is when he notices the depth of her empathy in the grieving of his brother like the the actual sort of romantic connection moment is like, oh, you feel as much as I do to a degree that is almost a hindrance. That's, I mean, the John Keats story. Yeah. Man yeah. would see a fucking flower and lose it. Right. Like, oh, John fuck. Keats is the best. Fran, yeah. what do you think of Johnny Keats? He's great. He's, He's so amazing. Um, he is the poet I responded to the most of the romantics when I was I love that. Him. And I love his sonnets, which I think are yeah. incredible. And I think sonnets are the coolest form of poetry. They are pretty good. I love, I was reading. They got that little rhyme at the end. You never see it coming. Oh, and they got it throughout. But, but it's know, the, the couplet. Little, the little couplet. The couplet. What's better? I mean, I like when poetry, I had to read a lot of poetry in school and I try to keep up with poetry, but I love when poetry has rules. Because I love rules. You prefer mm. that than just like, all right, baby, it's gonna be all over the place. I mean, that's me, baby. <laughs> that's me, baby. I that's like a ton like. of stuff that's all over the place. Sure. But no, you even, like I even rules. love like an invented form of mm-hmm. just like, here's my own thing. But I, I think I always work best with some kind of constraint. I mean, you're David baiting right now. Yeah, no, you I can't totally... say I love rules on this podcast love, without knowing I, what you're getting. This is probably why we're friends. Yeah, probably. The and rules. Ben and I are Lucy Goosey boy. We like fucking He's kicking down the doors. We love chaos. You know, I'm married chaos. to a poet, tree major, but she's my my <laughs> wife is a poet. <laughs> married to a poet, beat beat. beat. I mean, my my tree wife is, major. My wife is a high school English yes, teacher, yes. but she was a poetry major, and she writes poetry to this day, and she loves. Is poetry. that is that her favorite form to write now? Absolutely. It's the only form she Because we, of course, know that uh, your wife and I went to high school together. I know mm-hmm. her better than you, you do. do. I've known her for longer. Together, We're much right. closer than you and her are. Right. But in terms that's of That's cool. Length. Right? Is sort that cool? Sort of modern, yeah. Yeah, it's very modern that I sort of said, like, you know what? I think you two would be cute together. Oh. I didn't introduce them. They met organically, but I was like, no, I approve of this. Um, <laughs> but yes, we were in player and uh, class together. Your, uh, wife, your, enough, wife, your wife is right. a, an excellent writer, but I didn't know poetry was sort of her. That's favorite. her thing. Okay. Um. So anyway. Uh. But yeah, Keats. But Ke- but Keats. She's pro Keats. She's pro this movie. But mm. I'm I'm a real Keats ho. I love Keats. <laughs> I fucking love. I'm a Keats. slut for Keats. I am. I haven't read that much. Mm. But what I've read, I like the one I oh I feel like I read a lot of in college was Byron. Yeah, you see him. I, and he's I'm sort not of a, well versed. He's kind of a dang ass freak, but not he's in a, a good freak, way. He's a freak, but he's like a downer freak. Yeah, and I don't I'm know. Like, There's stuff that's been more recently exposed, like about him being kind of a creeper. Oh, he have can't he's canceled. Yes, he is. Byron. Did, okay. Yeah, he got up. To was some he shit. a member of that Thomas Middleditch club? <laughs> <laughs> what was it called? The Thomas Middleditch. It's the dumbest name. What is it? It's not like the Skull and Bones. It's but it's got like a name that's like performatively kind of like dark. Cloak and Dagger. Oh, no. Ugh. Um. Obviously, some of Keats's poetry is about Fanny Braun, such mm-hmm. as Bright Star. Um. And, you know, several others. Uh, he also wrote many hundreds of notes and letters to her that you can read that are 
super romantic (laughs) you know a lot of like i cannot exist without you you know my love is making me selfish you know like all this kind of like very beautiful overflowing stuff you know what's a a thing i really like about this film uh the the muse narrative is you know overdone and often oh sure reductive yeah uh, to to the women who are then pegged as the muse, right? Where it's like your existence was solely to inspire, inspire great, great art, art. from a, a boy, right? Sure. I feel like this movie gets across a clear distinction that it's like the muse was their relationship. Yeah, you I know wrote this saying? note down. Right, it's like, like the verb of their relationship right. versus her as just an object. Right. It was the love between the two of them, which was a two way thing. Rather than exactly her as an object, which I yes. think so often these narratives and it was like things. the process and the craft of their relationship informed the process and Correct. craft of his work. Right. It 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 unlocked different areas of his understanding to be able to love someone that fully for a man who clearly had that depth and sensitivity of feeling, but had largely been told or told himself. I, I can't have a relationship because I got to fucking hustle 24 seven to make these palms work. Cause I don't have a safety net to fall back on. Yeah. Sonic you know? grind set. Yeah. Right. It's, it's like, it's fucking hustle grind culture because yeah. you're just like, look, I didn't come for money. I don't have any connections. I got to fucking figure out my way in here. I don't have time for a relationship. I'll do that when I'm successful. Yes. That's the tragedy of this movie. The guy died barely getting to enjoy himself or, because he, right. Or you wouldn't have or any do affirmation as much work as he should have or get affirmation or any yeah. of these things because it, it, it was a time that was even more um, defined by class. I also love it would be easy to make a movie about a romantic poet and have it just be them. I don't know, running in fields and, you know, communing with nature. This in movie ways could have gone like, full Malik. Exactly. Yeah. And I feel a little uh, overwrought mm-hmm. because people think of romantic poets as overwrought, I think, right? Where mm-hmm. they're just like, ah, I'm, God's beauty surrounds me or whatever, right? And I think this movie shoots nature so beautifully, but like mundanely and like... It's not indulgent. Yeah, it makes those environments feel regular, but also obviously inspiring. And It also weirdly makes its like poeticism uh, conversational. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. <laughs> Guy's mostly just hanging out. A lot of writing is hanging out. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. not, in a he's room. not like, you know, which I mean, another one of Spitting my favorite sonnets. movies, Patterson, yeah. is also um, very good God, about. You the love most your fucking poet Incredible movies. movie. Uh, it's also about I the mundanity of life. Movies, and then but I know he's translating it. You're making a little together. face. I'm not crazy about that movie. <sighs> I, I'm similar. I don't. I, there's nothing I dislike about it, but I went into it wanting to have the fucking transcendent experience that Ben and David did, and I was yeah. just like, "Yeah, it's good." I don't know if we're how you don't we're like supposed. Wife. I I like the wife. Okay. I don't know if the movie wants us to be laughing at his wife or with his wife and her quirky little thing. I think that's like a I don't know if she's question. a punchline or not. Yeah, I don't. But think I love. She's, she's I love not a punchline her. at all. I think that movie is very tender about her, their relationship. Okay, and um, I remember she's cute and their dog is cute too. Oh, great dog and he knocks over the mailbox great moment yeah mm. uh but i remember seeing that movie with jordan hoffman friend of the show Humble Ray. who has a sort of similar relationship with his wife that those two have except that hoffman's oh, a little more a uh, little more avuncular uh, than, battered than uh, <laughs> adam driver's character yeah and no, i dig this but he was like you know he was saying like hey she's like you know and i was like yeah you know i get it yeah mm-hmm. anyway Hey, uh, fun fact, uh, my Uncle Ken drove the... Your famed uncle from Midnight Cowboy DVD fame? Correct, correct, right. correct. He drove that bus route, that same bus wow. route. Shit. Oh, movie. shit. Mm-hmm. Wow, because yeah. he's a bus driver in Patterson. If no one's he, seen Patterson, he Patterson been, spoilers. Yeah, he had been a bus driver in Patterson. <laughs> did wow. he like the movie Patterson? He did. Yeah, I was going to say. He likes this show, by the way. Shout out Ben. He started Bunkle. listening recently because I told him how to download podcasts. Yeah, and that's so, so nice. We made his fucking DVD collection famous. Yeah. Yeah. Ben my, my, Griffin threw um, Midnight Cowboy at me when I invoked it on the Walks episode. <laughs> I like, literally chucked a Midnight Cowboy, a, a one disker at your head. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway. Oh, wait. So you're talking about nature. Can we talk oh, sure. about the exterior, or the interior design? Mm hmm. Did you guys not? Ben I was like, like looking at us oh, right now, like he's about to tell us because a secret. I've been okay. watching a lot of HGTV. Okay, okay. Yeah. really I expected you to yeah, say deep into <laughs> just interior design culture. Yeah, this movie is 
so beautifully shot, but the rooms, man, because the romantic time in my mind, you can make it all like gaudy and candelabras, but you can kind of tell they like have money, but they're not, it's not like extravagant. Mm -hmm. They don't have servants. Sure. So it's just like, you get this kind of mundane kind of like portrayal of that time. Oh, I get what you're saying that like most period films like this, there's like such a kinetic energy to the home because there's a staff and there's yeah. the structure of the functions and yeah. right. The routines and all that. And this is right. It's got more of a casual vibe, but like her bedroom, like to me, I'm like, that is like, be that's a beautiful design. I like want that for my own home. Like mm. my girlfriend and I, the whole time watching, we we're just like, this is like, this is so gorgeous. Like, this is like, like shit you would like see, like as far as like interior design porn on Instagram now. But they're supposed yeah. to, the bronze are what? Middle class? They're not upper class, are they? No. So this is like that sort of pastoral middle class where I think even like, mm -hmm. you know, Pride and Prejudice, the Bennets are sort of like, yeah. they're middle class. We're like, that looks amazing, but it's like, they're not the wealthiest. No, this right. is sort of, no. Simple, but it's like it was, well, look, it's like you watch The Simpsons and you go, so you're telling me this guy's 34, he has a three bedroom <laughs> home, and we're t we're saying he's middle class. I mean, it's but exactly like that. I'm not even joking. Actually, I feel like it we, is one of those things. I feel where like Homer like, being 34 is like been talked about the whole I, last year. I think he's 36. I always or get one, one I think of those he's 37. Two, he's, he's it, but 30, it's one of those things. Where like, you That's fine. I'm still younger than him. I feel like, and you're like, I feel like Homer's age. They're supposed to be sure. lower middle class, and he like owns the house outright. They have two cars. All sure. that shit that just now is no longer like you're like. I see. That's impossible. I see. He yeah. was 34 yeah. in early seasons, 36 in season four, 39 in season eight, and 40 in the 18th season. He has okay. Sort of a comic book floating timeline. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. Exactly. They, you know, it was obviously you could, you know, you could get yourself a little pile of bricks when you were, you know, just sort of middle class back then. There's a lot yeah. less people. So they're not, they're on, not gaudy. I no, think is no, what no, Ben no. is saying. Like even that simplicity, sort of simple, like country life, is really enviable but at like, this point. But still, nonetheless, like Fanny is too fancy for John because he makes no money. Obviously, yeah. Yeah. like even though Fanny is also. You know, uh, Brown is like mean about her because she's kind of like déclassé to him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And he's like, you don't need to be. She she just likes ribbons. Like you know, you don't need to be hanging out with her, right? Um, but like that's one reason their romance is so genuine. I think is that like yeah. you know they 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 really loved each other. It's not you know this was not some she was not angling for this guy's fame or money yeah he was not angling for her like the security she could give him like there, there was nothing in their union that would have produced stability for them. money yeah money means nothing to them right. in this relationship and it's like you know a pastoral is like a type of poem and i think this movie functions in that way also where it just makes their country life look like the most enviable right. perfect natural place fair, to ever be fairly fringy the life he was living right you know? yeah uh, and but also like, i no sorry go well, on. What, the, the thing that he's fucking up by being in love with her mm -hmm. is that she could be getting married to someone who could give her a nice future yeah and that's what he keeps saying he's like someone should fall in love with you who can like fucking set you up because i can't yeah you know and i feel bad being in love with you for this <laughs> reason like it's a bummer like those, that's, that's, those that dances though man that shit is like corny. Oh, you I'm sorry. Oh, I, love, I gotta I love say, that. oh, I like it. I like it. And plus what? rules too. You learn the steps. You rules, learn the rules. Rules. Get out of here. At those dances, anyone can dance. When someone touches your waist, that's like the most intimacy you've right. ever had in your life. At and that you, point, and, and I'm like, that's go, cool. Ooh. You have to. I love those movies when they have the big dance. Dances oh, and the so dance good. card. Oh, mm. when the dance gotta card fill is up full. Your card. Oh, oh no! Fill up a card. I, I wanted love... to dance with Ba. Yeah, and then some like like Danny DeVito guy comes over. He's like, oh, my turn, and you're like, ah, shit, he's on my card. What do I, I do? I do wish like like my middle school dances had operated had with system. those. Like I I would have had a lot less anxiety if there was a clear structure. Oh, I think parties now you just fill up your card and then you don't have to talk to the people you don't yeah, want to talk to. Animals. You're like, nah, my card's full. I gotta they go. A party, right? Um, the thing I was going to say is yep. that unlike, you know, watching all these camping movies, it is such a through line, this sort of constant battle in all of her characters, or at least often her primary characters between their sexual impulses and their intellect. Right. right. And how often those two things are at odds with each other. Uh, and when that drive overrides it and works against their better judgment for, for better or worse. And this is a movie where like their attraction to each other is not really given 
that sort of force of animal sexuality to it. Like there isn't that sort of like primal impulse. Right. It is just this emotional connection that is so pure and outside of all of these structures. And it's not them fucking wanting to like rip bodices or whatever. They just want to be close to each other. They just want to be close. Yeah. They Which I think hands. is sexy in its own way. It's, it's super sexy. Erotic. Absolutely. Like, there's yeah. just not a lot of movies like this. Yes. Yeah. And usually if I'm coming to some fucking Euro financer with a hoop skirt drama, yeah. I might be promising like some bodice, rip a bodice. ripping. Yeah. yeah. And you know, instead she's like, no man, this movie's going to be gentle AF. Touch hands. Like, and the ki- he's like, right, there's going to be like very effective kissing. And that's the, the extreme, the most extreme end of it. Yeah. Um, yes. But, you know, uh, apparently one shot, Greg Frazier set up what Campion described as a sea of daffodils. And Campion was like, too corny, too Disney, mm. she said. Mm. And so she was like, get these fucking daffodils out. And they had to like stop filming and get all the daffodils, pull oh. them all up. That's funny because there's the scene with either, you know, the lilacs or the violets where it's Fanny and the two siblings just yeah. sort of laying in those. I like that that's not too corny a flower. Yeah. Daffodils, I agree, are corny. Um, I mean, speaking about the class and their relationship just for two more seconds, mm-hmm. I think the Keats estate sort of grew to kind of resent her and like the position that she had in his life and yes. did a lot to try to discredit her and one of those things that i think was referring to her as immature all the time because right. they had a sort of like mm-hmm. little age gap with them and i think one of the things bright star does effectively is like her immaturity is reflected in her optimism that they can pull this off sure. it's not that she's like not worthy of him it's that she sort of believes up until basically the end that like we're going to be fine. But that's don't you think that's also a reflection of the obsessive, the obsession, the cultural obsession with like great artists just being like pure geniuses who spit gold. Like they were just perfect and everything they did was excellent. Like not to fucking wade into this thing. I swear to God, I'm not going to fucking go down this rabbit hole. Oh, Jesus. But there was the recent fucking wave of Star Wars discourse where people were arguing Ugh, over whether shit cares? and Boba Fett resembled George Lucas's vision or not. Who right? Cares? This is all I want to say. This is all I want to say about uh-huh. it. Right. And there was this argument now where it's like this constant fucking back and forth of like, was George Lucas your messiah or was he an idiot savant who fell into Star Wars backwards, right? Yeah. And this idea of like, well, but George Lucas fucked things up. Like he had all these weaknesses and these other people saved Star Wars and all this shit. And it's like, the thing that weirdly feels removed from the conversation of how we understand artists at a time where I think more people want to talk about the process of how things are made and who the people are behind them and all that sort of shit is like, good collaboration is a sign of a great artist. It's not like you're a better artist if you know how to do everything perfectly and no one Mm. ever gives you any notes. Knowing the people surround yourself with, knowing when to take their advice and when not to, which influences to take, which happy accidents to observe, like which things you pull from in your life or influences in other art, like that's part of the soup. And I think people are obsessed with this idea of just like they're touched with brilliance and they sit down and they're fucking, they do a perfect work. And look at them. It all came out of their head perfectly realized. And it's like, no, like part of being an artist is being a fucking person in the world and meeting other people and pulling from them and experiences and all this sort of shit. So it's like this weird contradictory thing of like the obsession with telling stories about muses that romanticize that but turn them into objects. And then also like the scholars who uphold these artists being like, but like, let's not give too much credit to this fucking person. He was just the best. He just was a fucking great poet. What He just sat down, he wrote great poems, and he died. Uh, you know what a great movie about this is? What? The Wife. Mm. <laughs> what? <laughs> David if. just made such a face. <laughs> um, there was a two messing. The cock. Wife, the book, is actually very much about this and unpacks sure. it a little bit more. Because that's what the if, whole idea. Is, what if there was right. a wife? He did have a wife, and she actually wrote the books, right? Like, like in the movie, she's he's just copying. She types a document, and then he puts his name on it. Right. Whereas... The wife, yeah. the book is sort of about, you know, a writer who goes home every night and has a conversation with they his wife. They have a about, shared process. Sure. Yeah. Right. And she's sure. like, why don't I have a stake in this? Yeah, Which right. is a right. valid question. I drive feel my like car? The, the, sort sure, of drive my that. car. Yeah. The movie kind of turns him into Millie Vanilli. The movie turns Jonathan Price into Millie Vanilli. Oh, right. I yes, was like, yeah. Bright Star. Um, yeah, drive no, my car. Not, turns, not, not Bright Star turns Ben Wishaw into Millie Vanilli. Into Millie Vanilli. I want to tell you some more trivia facts that J.J. dug up. Please. As part of the casting process, Campion required every actor, every actor, mm. to recite a Keats poem from memory. And she was worried it would be repetitive and was like, it was so cool. 
everyone did things differently differently their personalities completely disappeared mm. the poem like you know so that's one thing once she cast wish on at cornish she would every day require them to perform small unfilmed tasks together like exchanging gifts mm. flowers anything like that she wanted them to just have like a little unspoken bond on set sure. um sense memory too yeah sure um and uh she about her great quote about wish shot i don't know why but I love cats, and when I first saw Ben Wishaw, I thought, oh my god, he's a cat. He's yeah. like the most yeah. beautiful back black cat you've ever seen. He's got this mysterious quality. He's, yeah. a, he's a bit of a cat, isn't he? Yeah, he's a great is. cat in this movie, too. Yeah. Topper. Oh, yeah. Love um, the cat. And obviously, uh, the first kiss, Wishaw, talking about it, we t- thought a lot about how that should happen, how they touch each other, how they're very sensitive to every physical interaction. They don't jump all each other all, all over each other. Small gestures speak volumes, mm-hmm. mm. which is very much the vibe of the romance in this movie, right? You know, yeah, I mean, little look, little moments. Celine Siama has talked extensively about what an influence Campion was for her. Hell yeah! But yeah. especially like obviously, Portrait of a Lady on Fire escalates to being more overtly sexual. But the same sort of studied of the micro gestures and movements and the sort of space between them or lack thereof and all that sort of stuff, this movie feels like so uh, attuned to. Campion's take on Schneider, he's like Jack Nicholson. So original his instincts. What comes to him comes from outer space. Like that, so like, cle- so like nice. he's yeah. like completely different energy on this uh, this set of like cool. fucking yeah. Ben Wishaw giving you know Abby Cornish some flowers. You know what? I think that's why I'm so surprised he nails the accent so much because he is much like Nicholson, one of those guys who I just think is like so behaviorally fascinating, and having not come from like an acting background. It, talks about being pretty instinctual where something like getting a fucking lilting Scottish brogue down feels like the kind of thing that like a drama school person knows how to like study and break down. And he just feels like a guy who just has like a good psychology for being in a scene and behaving and reacting and all that sort of shit. Uh, but yeah, he's fascinating. And I fucking miss him being in a movie. This is the, this is the great Schneider quote. What a funny guy this guy clearly is. Yeah. He should write more. Yeah. For crying out loud. Yeah. You have this beautiful feline guy, Keats, who drags a chair under a flowering tree and farts out the greatest poetry of the 19th century. The process through which Brown eked out any poetry was like passing a kidney stone. So he's saying, like, I'm kind of playing Brown with a tinge of like sort of Salieri, too, where it's kind of like, this guy is just, I'll never be like this guy creatively. Like, I sure. cannot believe how naturally it comes to him right. versus me. Like, and I. Think- I I think that's yeah. why that character is so protective of him too yeah. with this relationship is like, I know I'm living with a brilliant person and he shouldn't be distracted. Right. Right. Cause he thinks it's sort of his responsibility to help this guy become a great artist because what he lacks and sort of the natural instinct he maybe can make up for in like connections and stability and all that sort of stuff. Um, Schneider said this thing to me. I remember when we took this fucking the subway ride. What train home. is it? It would have been, uh, it would have been the one. We're gonna go friend. get him. The one train. It would have been the one train. We saw it at Lincoln Center. It would have been the one train downtown. Wow. Um, ferry. Yep. Yeah. But uh, I, I was, you know, at, at, at a relative career nadir at that point. But Common had, you know, uh, introduced me as an actor, and he was like talking to me as if I was like the fucking contemporary of like experiences with acting and shit. And because we've just seen Holy Motors, you get like very existential about like, oh, this weird thing we do for a living, pretending to be these people. And I just remember him having this comment where it's like, you know, it's a weird thing I think about all the time that I'm like, not like very famous and I'm not a movie star, but I've like done enough things that at any moment in time, there might be like, two guys sitting on a couch in a foreign country watching me holding a gun on TV. Right. That it's weird that these things I do are just sort of like, that that's an image where it's like, I would never hold a gun in my real life. You know? It's bizarre that I did that for a job. Right. And it's not like I'm fucking Clint Eastwood that has some mythic power, but yet that image sort of still ripples. Like, I think he's a very existential guy in that kind of way. Come on, blank check, Paul. Yeah. I have failed him. That line just murdered me. It's, I remember it's I was amazing. Just sobbing in the theater he's the first so, time but I saw it. He remains so I was so fucking unsettled gentle by this the first thing. time I saw it. Well, it's very unsettling re- the way he dies off screen, which is yeah, like absolutely think, how, of course, that that would have felt emotionally to her that he just vanished. The last twenty five yeah. minutes of this movie are so brutal. Yeah. When I first saw this, I was like, I'm 
not rewatching this again. It, I I don't I I yes, this movie is emotional in a way for me that I can't like throw it on, you know. Yeah. I, remind me, can we talk about the scene when he's like saying goodbye to her essentially? When yeah. and they both are sort of aware of like he's gonna fucking die before this he comes probably, back here. Mm-hmm. Right. He says as much. He's like, right. I don't think we're gonna see it. It's a statement. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's it's not even like a probably it's like, look, come on. Yeah. And then they have their like imaginary conversation of like, let's like say what we'll do when I come back. And their way of coping with like this being their goodbye is like play acting the life they're not going to get to live together. It's tough. It's amazing. That's I I rewatched this a couple of weeks ago and then I started it again last night just to have it fresh in my head. Yeah. And then I stopped it right after that it's, conversation. It's, I was like, you know what? I got it. Yeah. Oh, and I watched I Have Failed John Keats just because I mean, I love when he says that. But. Well, the way he says it where he's like at first trying to be like bravado dude. Like, yeah. Right. He's like, you want me to say it? I'll say it. You know, I'm not afraid of saying it. And then once he says it, he can't stop saying it because he knows like how much yeah, it, like, well, how much he failed him. Look, it's so well, incredible. Not to besmirch them, but I feel like most actors in this role would have turned that into a spotlight. They all knew scene. Oh, of course. Like right, they right. would have totally gone for emotional devastation, total sure, breakdown. It, yeah. Yes. It would make him a little more Oscar clippy in some way. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. The right. stomp is so good. Yes. It's so like human and real life tantrumy. Yeah. The, I guess yeah. what you're talking about, Griffin, is also the Oscar clippiness of like, there's catharsis. He admits yes. it. And instead it's like, he says this and you're like, okay, I can tell obviously how... Uh, how brutal this is for him but also it's like what am I, I supposed to do with this you know that's the thing it's yeah. not the catharsis he's not playing it as catharsis breakthrough in this moment I'm self-destructing and admitting the thing that's yeah, been right, eating right, away right. at me he's playing as like yeah I fucking know right you want me to say it I failed John Keats I think about this every fucking minute of my life he fucking failed him he fucking you blew him. it Charles he blew it I mean like you think of I've abandoned my boy I guess that, that yeah. that's a similar thing where it's like He's saying it because he knows he's supposed to say it at first. Right. And then the more he keeps saying it, the more you can tell, right. like, oh, it's break the dam is breaking inside right. him. Right. And Schneider somehow makes the scene emotionally devastating despite only playing the scene in the key of the first I abandoned my boy. Right. And that character is not, you know, redeemed, which a lesser movie would work to find some right. big understanding. But he's also not like he's also not a villain. But he's not punished right. either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. Right. Ben. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Griff. I gotta put you on blast again. Damn it, why are you blasting me so hard? I hate hard? to embarrass you in front of all our listeners, but I gotta blast you. Alright, fine. Blast away. It's a question you might not have the answer to and it might make you look a little bit dumb. Do you know why free trials were new without your consent? Uh, n- no. Well, it's a business scam. It's out to get you. You look dumb and they look evil. And I'm telling you, you shouldn't let greedy corporations pocket your money you should download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Okay, so interesting. So Truebill could help me manage mm-hmm. all of my various subscriptions. It's a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. Oh my God, it's I just did that recently with Discovery Plus. I was like, I want to watch HGTV. And then like, I don't know, Sign six months later, I'm still paying trial. for You're this paying for this. stuff. This is the thing, you just forget. You forget, and on average, people save up to 700 and twenty dollars a year. What the true bill? Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel. Is another thing. Some of these gym memberships. Look, this is me. I'm counting out the dollars that add up to seven hundred twenty dollars. It's one at a time. It takes forever. So long. True bill makes it incredibly simple. You just link your accounts. True bill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap, and your true bill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions, so you don't have to. If you're like me, you hate having to call up. Yeah, I'm sorry. Cancel this. Go to a website, figure out where so to log in. So much digital red tape. Your pi- or even remembering passwords to all these the places. Well, you know? Yes. It's so annoying. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped them save over $100 million. That's a number Dr. Evil would find impressive. Dave Matthews, who is somebody who's used the service, okay. he says uh, here. The musician? <laughs> Could be. Let's let's say yeah. it is. Okay. So just imagine this is Dave Matthews. Sure. Okay? okay. He said in a matter of seconds, I saved six hundred sixteen. Ben, I don't think he said it like that, and I think you know he didn't say it like that. <laughs> no, you're right. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, so he said, in a matter of seconds, I saved six hundred dollars for the year on my direct TV bill. I don't think that's how he said it. <laughs> I don't think that's how he said it. Can I take a stab at how I think he said it? <laughs> in a matter of seconds, I saved six hundred sixty dollars for the year on my direct TV bill. Save one hundred and twenty dollars on the year on my Sirius XM bill. Saved eight hundred forty dollars a year on car insurance. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash check. Yeah. Go right now to truebill.com slash check. It could save you thousands a year. Hold on one second. There's an additional testimonial I'm reading here. <laughs> it's from Bruce S. Bruce S. I use Truebill. <laughs> Get all my bill. Seven hundred and fifty dollars a month. I mean, you heard it from Bruce. Forgot that I signed up for BritBox. That's truebuild.com slash check. This film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2009. Mm -hmm. Lost to the White Ribbon, which I think is a good oh, movie. Oh, yeah, I think it's a very good film. But I prefer this film, personally. Okay. But obviously she had won the Palme d'Or before. And then who won the acting awards that year? That's a good question. Let's find out. Did you like the way I said that? Yeah, because these are two performances that feel very con. I mean, I totally ish. agree. Let's see. So the the jury president back uh, that uh, year was Isabel Huppert, ruling, ruling. I'm sure so with an sorry. iron fist and in a velvet glove. Uh -huh. I can well, only imagine. It, was Haynes? Some director had like a falling out with her during a can James jury. Gray. Oh, James. But Gray. He he says that in a way. James Gray is funny. Yeah, in a way that I think sometimes doesn't read in interviews. Yeah, but whenever you see videos of him, you're like, "Oh, this guy's joking." He says that in a way that feels more jokey than right. maybe. Okay, it comes okay. Out. Like, did they disagree about whether or not to put mustard on corned beef? <laughs> right. like, I don't. Yeah. I don't. Right. I mean, obviously, it's a. It's a. Uh, I'm gonna say this is a wild jury because you got James Gray, you got Lee mm. Chang Dong, uh, you got Robin Wright, you got mm. um, Asia Argento, Asia Argento. I forget how you say yeah. her name. Uh, yeah, a lot of Hanif Qureshi, uh, you know, a lot of sure interesting cats. Um, best, the Palm Door goes to uh, the White Ribbon, which was a mild surprise, I guess, because had not, no, maybe Hanif had hadn't won, won before. before. Yeah. No, he wins again for Amour. I, am now, I wrong in thinking he's won three times? Has he won three times? Win for Piano Teacher? Because no, I Piano Teacher won. Um, I guess it actress makes sense. or something. Okay. You know, it makes sense that award. she would go for her guy, though. You know, I doesn't. I, it? I don't sure. know. Yes, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. remember when, like, when he no, won. He for won the Amor. Grand Prix for Piano Teacher. Okay, so no, he had never won the. Prix. Okay, because Moore is one of those things where it's like oh, we just gave it to him, but this is kind of undeniable. Like right. it was that one was of those things where they're like, "Fuck, yeah." Uh, the Grand Prix went to a prophet. Okay, good movie. Yeah, in my opinion. Um, best actress went to Charlotte Gainsbourg for Antichrist. Isabel, <laughs> <laughs> what are you up to? And best actor went yeah. to Christoph Waltz for Inglorious Bastards, oh, okay. which was the first sign of like, who is this? Fuck, he's right. in the Tarantino movie and he won Cannes. Right. Cool acting? for her to do, right? Definitely. Well, but right. then also, obviously, then he just becomes the story of that right. movie. Right. But good segue into me saying. That Quentin Tarantino, who was in competition uh -huh. against Jane Campion, wrote her a letter saying, Dear Jane, bravo, 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 four exclamation points. Sorry, three exclamation uh -huh. points. I wanted to correct myself. My favorite film of yours. I don't like period pieces like that. I loved this. Never has heartache been so realistically and movingly portrayed. Heart like, feels good in a place like this. Uh, so Heartbreak. T t uh, Tarantino adores Bright Star. Yeah. It's the best film I've seen since uh, Three Musketeers 3D. <laughs> um, it's always funny seeing his year-end list where it's just like, oh, it's clear that Tarantino weirdly only sees six new films a year. Right. He sees did like- Did he do a know, 2021 one? I don't think he did. Come on, Tarantino. I know. Get I with it. I want it. Let's see. I feel like he didn't, though. Well, what's this? Hmm? Uh, this film? No, no, this is some other okay. bullshit. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, he should do one. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and the movie got good reviews. Right? Yeah. I mean, yes, like, no, it was well-received. I think it was like a critical darling that was hamstruck with a distributor that did not know how to properly release this <laughs> that thing. That was definitely the... And there was yeah. more vitality to the indie 
distribution world at this point. Like this could have become a minor crossover hit. And I think it was just felt like Apparition doesn't know how to make these things work. You know, it's that funny Oscar year where it becomes Avatar versus um, Kurt Locker. Kurt Locker. Right. Which are these sort of, right, both. David and Goliath exes. But like both, obviously. Sure. You know, and like yeah. obviously Inglorious Bastards is a big movie that right. year. Uh, uh, an education. Uh, education, right. Uh, well, like, precious up uh, District right, 9. Precious is a really big deal that year, yeah. right? Up in the Air is a big deal. That yes. Year, you know, it's kind of a year, loaded year. Oscar year, but obviously. And I that's was, the first expanded field year. That's the year that's where the they first, make right. it 10. Yes, because the year before had been the Dark Knight. Right. Year, right. Yeah. Um, but obviously, it's a little sad this movie didn't get. And I guess it's just because it's so quiet and gentle is also yeah. part of it. It's a, it's I a don't tough... know that this would have broken through. I think, look, I don't yeah. think it could have. Just because it can't be, and I would have thought, you know, maybe, maybe I don't yeah. know. I don't, I don't think it may, could have majorly broken through. But this movie made, like, less than a million dollars domestically? No, no, no. It made no? more than a million, I think. Let's see. I just feel like a Fox Searchlight or Universal Focus could have gotten this movie it, like two it, or three steps further. It made a healthy four point four million dollars. Okay, you domestic. know, what? it made seventeen worldwide. That's so better probably, than I remember. Bad, it pretty worldwide, much it doubled its, its budget yeah. worldwide. Like it yeah. didn't hurt anything, anyone's feelings. But yeah. yeah, I agree with you that in the hands of a Sony Pictures Classics or whatever, right. it probably mm-hmm. would have. Because I even yeah. I feel like Young Victoria did better than this, and that had the benefit of even though being released by Apparition. It had like a bigger star, and a, and, and a, it had a more conventional like oh it's one of these it's like but they're hook. big it, it's yeah. bigger I just worry that this that's is, a bigger movie and like I feel like the period pieces that were doing well at that time yes are well, like that's you know the Joe Wright ones which are yes. pretty big and yeah. that kind of thing I mean Young Victoria it's just like we all know Victoria and everyone's like old <laughs> always old yeah. old lady big black dress and the guy's like. Mm-mm. You know what? Lot, not a lot of people know like, I don't is that. Did you know that I've Victoria used to fuck her husband 18 billion times a day and had like 20 kids? And did you know? No one knows this, but uh, uh, Steve from Blues Clues actually wrote the theme song for Young Victoria. Go right ahead. That's a joke for two people. Yeah, I've got to say, I don't, I, I don't know it. He did the fucking theme song for Young Sheldon. People love to throw that out. Is it? Did you know? Someone is speculating that Lynch is playing John Ford in this movie. Fuck. I mean, if that's true. Oh fuck! <laughs> I mean, I don't know what this movie is. How how deep into Spielberg's like career it's gonna get? Like, but no, but he's but Ford he's is told the guy that he meets, story a lot. Right? Ford's yeah. one of the first people he meets. God, can, oh fuck! Can you imagine David Lynch wearing an eye patch on screen? You know what? I can. <laughs> I can imagine. It. Can, can you imagine it. how much that's gonna fucking rock? Uh, shall we play the box office game? Is there any more bright star we want to get to? Fran. I love Toots. Just want to say it. I love mm. this child. Yep. I think she's so sweet. She's so cute. I Let think... me give you a quote about her, actually. But no, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just think Campion's so great with kids. She and the kids is. feel so perfectly kid-like. And hasn't done that many movies with kids, but always gets incredible naturalistic performances from them. Like, me... my favorite sequence in this movie is when Toots is sort of escorting them back from when... Fanny and Keats have gone to make out Mm -hmm. and that every time she turns around they sort of freeze to kind of fuck with her a little bit and I think it's such a gentle jokey thing to do with a child and I love when Toots tells John that she loves him we've also talked about this a lot David but that like that's one of those movie star tests where you're like are you good with kids Mm -hmm. it's one of those things you kind of can't fake where it's like oh you have good chemistry with kids you're either gonna be good at this or bad right your craft is adaptable enough that like kids act in totally different ways like Mm -hmm. any director who's good with kids Talks about like you got to meet them where they are, you know. Let and me. Both of them are so fucking good with the kids. Let me read it. this quote as a perfect underline of that. She was camping on Edie Martin, the actress playing yeah. Toots. She was wonderful, but because she was such a baby, she got frightened. She'd say she had tummy aches. Mm-hmm. I calmed her down by showing her how to create a bubble for herself. It's easy. You stretch out your arms, and that excludes all the people who are making you nervous. My job was just to help her relax and be herself. I told her to forget about the camera, and then I left her alone. But I just love this image of Campion being like, make a bubble. That is so fucking mm. sweet. Isn't it? I, I'm like really touched Griffin's by moved that. by that. I'm really moved by that. There's that great Tom Hardy profile and maybe Esquire where like they run into like a father and toddler and Tom Hardy tries to speak to the toddler because mm. I guess he like loves kids and the kid is immediately afraid and Hardy has this great quote of like, I can see I've frightened you and I'm walking away. 
<laughs> just immediately excuses himself. It's like, I see what I've done here. I'm removing myself but from the that situation. But weirdly shows you that he's good with kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, he's like, I'm not exactly. salvaging this. I, yeah. I came on right. too strong. Right. Yeah. I came on with that. And I'm yeah. sensitive enough <laughs> that so I want to right. defer to you. You you get. He's like, I can see I've upset you. I give you I, the high ground. Maybe it's like, I will disappear or something. It's so God, good. God, that's so good. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. Uh Anyway, let's play the box office game. Sure. This movie came out September 18th, 2009. Not a good release date, in my opinion. No, that's Don't dump that, this movie there. That's that kind of zone where it's like... Right after TIFF. Right. Early Oscar. And like, you're like, mm. is this going to be a slow burn? Do we need to long play it? Because it's not going to pop until November, December. We got to just keep it burning until then. And uh, Apparition didn't have the strength it looks like, to keep it going that long. It looks Fucking like they apparition. did this all wrong. Yeah. They opened it it's on, unbelievable they were actually called Apparition, apparition. and that they were just like... <laughs> uh, they put it on 19 screens. That feels wrong. Put it on either like two or yeah. 200. Like, yeah. I don't know. Like, any, anyway, it opens number 33. Okay. I mean, it's a small release, obviously. But this is a four out of five new movies week. Wow. Uh, okay. In the top five. So it's a September 2009. Correct. And the first, the number one film of the week is an animated film that you're very fond of. Uh, I. It's not Hotel Transylvania. No. 2009. It's not Coraline. No. 2009. I do like you keep saying 2009. Yeah. No, no, no. Because I'm trying to think. The best animated, animated film. The best animated film nominees in 2009 are Up, Coraline. Sure. Fantastic Mr. Fox. I believe it. Secret of Kells. Ah, good movie. And was this movie nominated or was it snubbed? Well, let's find out. Animated feature film of the year. I'm like, is this the fifth that I'm forgetting? Or it was, was it not really nominated. Small? The fifth nominee was The Princess and the Frog. But this movie oh, probably yeah. could have deserved a nom. But that's hmm. five good nominees, so maybe not. Yeah. It's a comedy. It's based on a children's book. It's a comedy that's based on... Uh, what form of animation? Is it oh, CGI? 3D CG. Yeah. I might know. Go on. Is it Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? Sure oh, it is. Of course. It's a great movie. Yeah, it's a wonderful film. But do you put it in those five? I would. I mean, you know, I'm not very fond of Princess and the Frog, which you think is rude. I don't like Up. I also Up is I, near I, the I bottom of my pretty up, flawed, but I, look, know, there's I, things about Up that I are like impressive. Up. Right. I just think it is very flawed, almost in, intrinsically flawed in a canon that I think includes like double digit perfect movies. Sure. Um, yeah. But I, I guess I keep Up in. I put Cloudy over Princess and David would say rude. Rude. Uh, number two at the box office is a based on a true story film from one of our great directors. Okay. Other three movies in that five are obviously undeniable bangers. Oh, Kells, in, Coraline, in animated film. Sure, yeah, Fox. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, yeah. go on. Um, hmm, kind of like a satire comedy, black comedy, physical the transformation. Informant? It's the informant. Yeah. yeah, Matt Damon is the informant. Yeah, uh, a, a movie, movie I'd I, like to rewatch. I've only seen the one time. Never yeah. seen it. Matt Damon. He's the informant. Yeah. There's that great Paul F. Tompkins bit about yes. Matt Damon eating the cube. Yeah. One of my favorite Paul F. Tompkins stand up bits of all time where he talks about like having like being at a dinner with Matt Damon and Matt Damon eats like a blue cube. And Dick Paul Tompkins is like, why is no one talking about this? <laughs> right. Why is he eating a cube? He shot and it. It's like, like some weight loss thing that like uh, only rich actors know. He shot it like sandwiched in between two Damon action movies. I yeah, think. or like an oceans and a board. Right. Like he whatever. had to look like Matt Damon right before and right after mm. with no time. And there was but this cube I, that somehow stabilized it's like his weight. A blue until, cube. Yeah. You just have yeah. to listen to it because there's this okay. moment where Paul Tompkins is like, what about the cube? <laughs> anyway, it's really good. It's that's the movie, and I feel like this is a trick he has used a number of times since then. He certainly does it in um, Magic Mike and Behind the Candelabra and fucking uh, uh, the the Laundromat and all all these movies. But that's a movie where like everyone in the supporting cast, outside of Damon Bakula and Melanie Linsky, is primarily a comedian. Right. Yes, absolutely. Like it's like Joel McHale, Joel McHale and the Smothers yeah, yeah. Brothers and Tom Papa yeah, and Paul yeah. F. Tompkins and all these fucking people. 
And I was just like, why is he only pulling from comedians? And he's like, in movies like this where you have a lot of like bureaucrats and government agents and these characters who are like functionaries and have a lot of exposition, it can get so dry that I find if you hire comedians, people who are innately funny and tell them to play it entirely straight, it still gives it a little more energy than dramatic actors who try to turn it into something. And I just think it's always interesting now where I look for that in those sorts of roles where it's like, oh, Cristela Alonso is like the cop in this. Because she'll just give it a little something. Uh, smart director. That's a smart way to use that. Love actors. him. I'm excited for Kimmy. Kimmy. Out Kimmy. next week. Kimmy. Kimmy. Number three is a Tyler Perry film. Okay, 2009. Would it I love be... how it's a Tyler Perry film. There's just such a vast amount of No, guesses. but I think I might be able to get this. Is, oh. it, is it Medea Goes to Jail? Nope. Fuck. I think that's 2010. He's doing two a year. He's mostly doing about two a year. This, this would is, be a non-Medea, right? This is a... This is a Medea movie. Fuck. Okay, but that makes me think she's not in the title. She sure isn't. Hmm. Okay. It's not... Is it Meet the Browns? No. Uh, it's not Family of Praise? No. I don't think Medea's in that one. No, I don't either. That's why I said it's not. Uh, stupid. Stupid to even verbalize. Stupid. stupid. Dumb, <laughs> dumb, dumb fucking idiot. Um, okay. Stop, stop. <laughs> don't okay, fight. Okay, on the title. Fucking... Stars an Oscar nominee. Oh, it's I Can Do Bad All By Myself. I Can Do Bad All By Myself. Good title. I should have known title. that. Because the apartment I lived in in 2009, we got that poster when they threw it outside a movie theater and we put it on the wall. The thing with... I love came the Tyler Perry movie sign posters the poster. yeah. that are like that, that are like a flower with a face in it that are impressionistic versus the ones that are just like, Medea! And she's like kind of just whatever, doing guy something. Who was like, Some of those posters are so fucking good. The guy who was like the graphic marketing guy for Lionsgate was like a genius yeah. and released like a coffee table book of all of his work, which is like really underrated in terms of how much he got Lionsgate, like stole like 10% of the market share of the US box office for those years just through posters and like billboards and shit. And this is the poster I'm referring to. Every Tyler Perry movie Love it. pretty yeah. much had two posters. Yeah. One of which was like sort of abstract poetic. Kind of a teaser. And usually. one of which was the comedy poster. But it wasn't even necessarily that they'd be teasers. They'd have both of them up simultaneously and just hit different markets. This is the sort of main poster, which is also still fairly dreamy and impressionistic. It's, it's the least. But then right. you're forgetting of, with this that there was also a third poster that is a parody of the Straw Dogs exactly. poster. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, of Medea's they'd glasses always, breaking. Like, right. They'd always do that. Like even going back to Diary of a Mad Black Woman, Another like the main poster is a flower, and then the second poster is like Medea holding a, a gun, gun to camera. That's right. Um, all right. Number four at the box office okay. is one of those movies where I'm like, I guess I remember what this is. Mm -hmm. Oh, fuck. It's a romantic hmm. drama hmm. with two actors who I feel like at this point should be riding high. Yeah. And it's kind of a star of how these actors really needed to be with other stars to... Huh. Be stars. This is a movie that like seems it has the title and tagline of a fake movie in another movie. It's not Time Traveler's Wife. No, no, no. That's way too right. good. <laughs> right. But this is this is a movie no one remembers. Uh huh. This is a movie like in a movie, right. like a uh, fucking Don John gets dragged to see this movie right. by Scarlett Johansson. It's like I hate chick flicks. Right. It's I not, like porn flicks. It's not definitely maybe. That's what he would do. No. But it's like it's a it's like a, a definitely maybe adjacent film. Is it like think? a Sparks thing? No. Okay. Hmm. Is no. it based on anything? No. Huh. I believe the uh, the man is playing a widow. It's not Knights in Redanthe, is no. it? No. Okay. Good movie that Fran watched recently, right? I watched yeah. on a play. Yeah. Well, my thing I want to say about it is a spoiler. Is yeah, well, don't spoil it. Okay. I fell asleep and I woke up 10 minutes later and the stakes had drastically changed. Wow. And yes, I was like, what the hell? Um, uh, <sighs> but I love Richard it's about a widower. I, it's about a widower who's, it's a who dates a florist. Song. It's about a widower who dates... Okay. I'm going to have to give you more clues. Um, the star, the male lead, had just been in a huge superhero film the, the previous year. Okay, 2009. Is it Robert Downey Jr.? No. 2008. There was a huge superhero film. Yes, and what's it called? Right, so there's it was Dark a big Knight. Deal. The Dark Knight, yes. He's in The Dark Knight? He sure is. Who's in the oh, Dark Knight? Oh, 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 oh. Is this the fucking Aaron Eckert, Jennifer Aniston movie? It sure is. And what's and it's it called? called? Love Happens. And what's the tagline? <sighs> Sometimes when you least expect it, dot, 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 dot love, love happens. happens. He plays like a motivational speaker. Correct. He's a self-help author who is a widow. Yeah. 
widower. Sorry. Right. And uh, Jennifer Aniston is a florist. And guess what I've they date? This. I was going to say, I've definitely never seen this. Martin yeah. Sheen, Judy Greer. I think Dan I've Fogler. maybe seen this. Mm. Well, Nothing love happens. It. It's opening number four, but holy shit, it's still beating number five, a beloved cult classic that put its filmmaker in director jail. We'll probably do her one day. It would have to be. It could be nothing but Jennifer's body. It's Jennifer's body, which yeah. could not even topple Love Happens no. in its mm. opening weekend. This was its opening weekend? Number five, Fuck. opening it to $6 million. Wow. Uh, you've also got nine... Remember nine? The Italian. No, the other one. The 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 animated no. film. There were two nines in two thousand nine. That was sure. Like, this is not the Italian. This was numeral nine. This is the animated one. Yeah. Correct. It was like a student film that fucking Tim Burton and Timor, yeah. whatever his name is, who did. I do remember the this. fucking. What's what are those movies called? The Vampire Night Day. Yeah, uh, Day Watch, Night Watch. Right. Yeah. Uh, they were like, Tim this Burton is the Rodikoff. new guy. Yeah. And he's got a whole fucking world where we're going to make sequels. And that movie came out. And when Focus was like releasing Leica movies and like maybe we can release mid budget animated films. Yeah. And it made very little impact. And that guy has like never done anything ever again. Shane Acker. I believe you. Yeah. Um, nine. Okay. Nine. I just remember seeing that trailer like way too many times. Shane Acker. You're yes. correct. And it's got like Elijah, Elijah Wood, Wood. Jennifer Collins, yeah. Christopher Plummer. It's like all high No Fergie, actors. right? No Fergie. Be you, cool. You've also got Inglorious Bastards. I was going to ask. Still about in that. there. Still in there. Uh, you got All About Steve's because this is the Sandra Bullock flop hype yeah. year. You yeah. know, where, yeah. Uh, you've got Sorority Row. Sure. Uh, don't right. remember that. No, that's a that's like a 70s horror remake right. with, uh, I want to say, Rumor Willis. Correct. I believe uh, Carrie Fisher plays the head headmistress or Still something. Up, you're right. Yeah. Uh, and the final destination. Is that the fourth? Fifth. Yes, right. Because then they make Final Destination five after that. It it is such a box but office. V bump. was yeah, it was like a slight reboot, right? It was kind of been a few years. No, it was supposed to be the last. The, the, they call it V because they were like, hey, we're done. Right. They run out of steam, and then they add three D on this one, and it explodes overseas, and then the like J K J K Final Destination five. It was supposed to be full finale. And That's now it's getting rebooted. Your top ten for Bright Star. We're done. Fran, wow. Fran, we did it. Wow. Yeah. Wow, we did oh, it. Fran. Um, can I plug some poets that I know? Poet time, baby. I complained about poets a lot when I was in my graduate program because they lived around the corner from me and drove me insane. But the fact is that the economy of like doing poetry as your job is basically the same now as it was in like 1818, except mm. there are more types of jobs people can have that they can do while they're doing poetry. It's It is funny that this... Like there's this idea of like oh, you used to be able to make a living doing poetry and now all poets are broke and you watch this movie and you're like, no, nah, it's never been like a booming industry. No, it's like even now it's like maybe there are three professional full time poets. You gotta get the laureate. Yeah, yeah, the laureate and then two guys who should have gotten the laureate. Right. right the um, runner ups. But I went to school with a lot of great poets who I loved. And I just wanna sort of there's Shout if you wanna read out. books, Tracy Fuad has a great book called About Blank on a Portnoy. Brimmer has To Love an Island. Ananda Lima has Motherland. These are all books that came out if you're like, I want to read an 80-page book, which is a great length of book to read if you're like, I feel bad that I don't read more books. But then Spencer Williams, who does stuff at Bright Wall Dark Room with me, is an amazing poet. Sidney Jin Choi, Weston Ritchie, Walter Ancaro, Emily Luan. You could Google any of these people with poet and you're going to find a bunch of their stuff. And these are like... Poets who I think are amazing, who are all working in different forms and doing stuff that excites me when I see and hear about it. And it's tough because I think what makes poets now, not unlike then, is getting the book deal. But that is a really, really hard thing to do. So most of them publish online and for free. I mean, for free for you to read. It's the one benefit that it is easier to distribute poetry these days. Absolutely. It is no easier to sure. monetize it. But True. Right. Yes. And, I think, and I think poetry is deceptively accessible, too. And I like the way... You know, she writes Keats explaining like when you dive into a lake, the goal is not immediately getting back to shore. Mm. It's being in the lake. And I think people are like, I don't understand poetry. Poetry makes no sense. And it's like, I think that's because you're looking for like a three act structure in a poem when right. they don't Where, have that. Whereas poetry, it's almost more like it's a quick bite of content. Like, oh I don't even God. know how what word I would use to describe. Oh, my God. Wow. I can't believe, I I can't believe you would summon it. Um, that's what Katzenberg should pivot to. Hundred billion dollars for poets. Yeah, that'd we be think good. Kids want to read poems while taking a shit or waiting for a bus. 
Maybe. Maybe they do. Yeah. Poetry's good. Who am I to say they aren't? Yeah. I love poetry. Shout out to Edgar Allan Poe. Sure. I'm trying to think of some other he poets I like. Yeah, he needs it. <laughs> Poe's po been hurting. <laughs> That's true. He does need the attention. Actually, you know what? Poe, he's a great... Um, you can Dang visit a, a ditch in Baltimore where they found him. <laughs> there you go. Is that Ditch true? history. Ditch history. <laughs> Rich history, ditch history. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, fair enough. Fair enough. Fan, yep. Fran, you're Fran. I'm a you're fan. You're fantastic. Aww, you're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for gracing us with your presence and uh, kindly gifting us with another uh, Fran bump. Happy to do it. Ready uh, for truly. for our Brightster episode? To you just guys need it. Suplex the struggle, struggling podcast. I know you do. Pop culture happy hour. We're just gonna fucking <laughs> <laughs> give him a pile driver this week. This is one of my favorite movies. Had to have Fran. Yeah, I was saying this... this is probably the best movie I've talked about on here. Not to discredit Aliens, but uh, I mean you've talked about some good movies. You've talked about I know, some but pretty I good just movies. Have... Pretty lucky. Right? About the holidays, Skibidi Doo. I know. Well, I mean, that's like... a perfect movie. Fair. Sort of in another class. Well, Public Enemies is like the worst movie you've covered, and it's a pretty fascinating film. Totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. And and I, look, you so kindly and generously plug uh, some of your favorite poets, but you should plug your own work that people should read. Fran Magazine. Fran Magazine. Fran magazine. Substack. Com. It's so good, guys. I'm having a lot of fun it. with it. Yeah. I'm ready to get bought out though after yeah. three weeks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> someone should, right? Oh yeah. Katz- Katzenberg. Lo- yeah. Katzenberg, if you're figures? listening. Yeah. Um, Is that I would the take, Wordle deal? Oh, I would take low seven. Um, yeah, franmagazine.substack.com. I'm on Twitter and mm-hmm. Letterbox, all under my own name. Mm-hmm. Brightwell Dark Room always has great stuff. I haven't done anything with them for a sec, but great I'm stuff. editing and I'm helping out. Yeah. Uh, you 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 were very involved in the Margaret issue, right? No, I wasn't involved really? in the Margaret okay. issue because I only just watched Margaret probably three months ago for wow. the first time. Great wow. movie. And had a meltdown. Yeah, it does that to you, huh? Yeah. yeah. Um and I was like I can never sit through this again. But that issue is incredible. Yeah, it's it amazing stuff. No, I wrote for um Best of 2021 on The Souvenir Part 2. Mm. Perfect movie. Uh which which cut of uh, Margaret did you watch? I watched what was whatever was on Criterion when it was on there. So I think directors. Okay. Is that the good one? I disagree with some people, but I also just think you, it's They're interesting to watch both of them. They're yeah. all good. I want like New World style, like five cuts of that movie circulating. Sure. That and there movie are really other cuts unse- that just have That movie noticed. unsettled the shit out of me so much. I can't oh, yeah. think about it's it too hard. But oh, in like four years, I'm going to come back to it and watch it like uh-huh. three times in a week. And then I'll be like, I'm in. Uh huh. Can he make another movie? His Howard's End is so good. Can I plug his I've Howard's End? I need to oh, fucking watch Matthew that. Oh, Matthew McFadden. Yeah. Folks. We love him. And we love our friend. We do. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media. Joe Bowen and Pat Rounds for our artwork. Lane Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song. Uh, Alex Barron, AJ McKeon for our editing. JJ Birch, Nick Loriano for our research. Uh, we have a website now. We there will there's a web there will be a website now by the time you're listening to this. I mean, I think it's happening. Yeah, yeah. I think it'll be. I think it'll be. Uh, so just check social media for a website, which now contains all the things I used to have to spend twenty five to forty five seconds plugging individually. But we should say that if you go to Patreon.com/slash Blank Check, you can get Blank Check special features. We're about to go back to the Matrix. Yes, back to where it all started. Back to the Matrix. Uh, yeah. Have you, gone, have you ever gone back to the Matrix? I have. David's giving me the wrap it up fingers. Uh, next week, Power of the Dog. We fucking caught up to present arf, day. Arf. Woof, woof. Oh. Uh, off the leash. Uh, excited, excited, excited. Uh, uh, so yeah, tune into that. And as always, Paul Schneider, come back. But every time we we tell the story every fucking time. But in the early days of the show, we went in for a meeting with a big podcast network and they were looking at our numbers and they said, who is the guest on this episode? You really do say this you every say this time. Every time. Every time. It's, so funny. This out it's sort of, of it's so funny. No, this we can't. And he was like, this. for my first This is time. embarrassing to me we now. Have I have no job. Where is this man? I want have a job. <laughs> I want to say something that's new.